Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, welcome back to Karnataka ENT Hospital Innovative Masterclass 2020 series programs. That is fifth session of the international webinar on uh, pediatric airway problems. And this fifth session of the series deals with newer techniques in pediatric airway management. And this program is being spearheaded by none other than Dr. E. V. Raman of Manipal Hospital, Bangalore, a kind of Bhishma Pitamaha of airway surgery in the country. And we also have distinguished faculty from premier institutes of India as well as uh, abroad. And I thank all our participants, uh, the audience. Uh, I, thank the, I thank them very much for making earlier four sessions a great success. And we have received the rare reviews for these programs. Nevertheless, we seek your feedback, suggestions, and constructive criticism about the uh, future program content and format. Okay, please feel free to write to us with this. I hereby invite Dr. E. V. Raman sir to take over and moderate the session. Meanwhile, please post your questions in the chat area, which will be discussed intermittently and also at the end of the session. So, Dr. Raman sir, please take over. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prelad, for those kind words. And uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here today with such distinguished airway surgeons from India and all over the world. We've been privileged to get the collaboration and cooperation of the top uh, airway centers in the world. And we need to uh, nurture this and take it forward for the benefit of all the young doctors, aspiring airway surgeons. And um, we have a very distinguished um, speaker panel today, apart from the expert panel. As you know, towards the end of the talk, after the talks, we have this open house where you can ask the expert questions and then we have a good exchange of ideas between ourselves. And uh, without much ado, uh, we'll start off the program with, and then the, um, I'll just briefly tell you about the speakers. Uh, Dr. Douglas Siddell is the first speaker today. He's going to talk to us about balloons and beyond. Then following him is Dr. Alok Tucker, Professor Head of the Department of All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He's going to talk on the role of lasers in the airway, pediatric airway. And Dr. Ramandeep from the PGI Chandigarh is going to talk to us about the role of coagulation in the pediatric airway. We have a very distinguished panel, Dr. Sajan Gandhi, who's a pioneer in uh, um, laryngology and airway surgery from Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital, the head who has been working for many years and has been holding wonderful workshops and some people have been induced to get into laryngology as a subspeciality thanks to him. He's going to be one of the panelists, and we have our regular, I call him partner in crime, Dr. Deepak Mehta, who's been with us all the time, encouraging us, and he's going to be around as a panelist. And um, the speakers also will be around to the extent possible to answer questions. And um, Dr. Rakesh, Dr. Shashidhar, Dr. Mary, uh, innumerable people in the uh, audience, Dr. Uh, Ajay Matthew from CMC Velour, uh, I'm sure I'll miss some of the names which I'll mention again. They've been staunch supporters of this. So which, uh, without much ado, I request uh, Dr. Siddell, who is an associate professor in Stanford University and uh, a very, very active airway surgeon in the United States and internationally known, is going to give the first talk on balloons and beyond. <laughs> professor Doug Siddell. Uh, you can share your screen, sir. Yeah. And we have Dr. Soit. Uh, Kunotra here. Uh, he's um, from the University of Iowa. He's been kind enough to join as a panelist. You'll see more and more of him as we go along this um, program. Uh, we'll have talks and lectures and discussions with him too. And um, uh, Dr. Kishore um, is slightly preoccupied. Kishore Sandhu from University of Lausanne. He might join us in a little later. So I welcome all the speakers and the participants. Do you can start off. Good morning, can you hear me well? Yes, sir. Yes. So it's an honor to be here. Um, I know uh, many of you uh, personally as well as uh, through you know, WhatsApp. And I apologize, Dr. Raman, in advance for being a very, very amateur uh, WhatsApp user compared to uh, my partner, Karthik. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here and it's a true honor. You know, I, this is balloon dilation, as you all know, is, is not a new technique. It's it's you know a decade and a half uh, in the making, but people are constantly doing new things with the balloons. But 
you know, this talk is really basics of the balloon because I think that one of the things that people, you know, start to do these days is they pick up a balloon and they may not have the most experience with using it for traditional subglottic techniques and they jump right to doing something more extravagant and it, it's not always the right thing to do. Um, and I think that just the simplest techniques such as dilating an airway can be done correctly and incorrectly. So we'll talk a little bit about the basics of balloon dilation. Um, I am at uh, Stanford. We have a, a faculty of nine in the pediatric division out of uh, 58, I believe, in the department. Um, and Karthik, Balakrishnan, and Kara Meister are my uh, you know, partners in crime in the airway uh, group. And we, we really manage the, the vast bulk of the uh, airway practice that Dr. Colt I helped build. So let's get started with balloon dilation and feel free to stop me and ask me any questions. Um, my email also is literally just my first initial and last name, D-S-I-D-E-L-L -L, at stanford.edu. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to me via email or via WhatsApp at any time. Um, so, you know, this is kind of the classic picture we see and maybe once upon a time was treated with open airway reconstruction. You have a young patient with grade three subglottic stenosis and we saw you know, two of these patients last week um, that were actually looked like this in the congenital state, which can be quite alarming when you're going to surgery for, a, you know, tetralogy of flow repair, for instance, and you don't know what lies beneath. Um, the balloon, uh, however, has, has come a long way in, in making this problem uh, less complicated for many patients. Um, you know, we can take a patient like that and we can take a, a Jackson dilator, for instance, which is historically used. They're a rigid dilator or um, the open-ended rigid dilators. But the problem with these is they generate a shear force. And so you have more uh, tissue trauma associated with them. And you're also distalizing a, uh, a dilator prior to actually seeing where the tip goes. So it's, it's not the ideal dilator, but in the right hands, these dilators can actually be, be very, very effective. Uh, the balloon dilation is, you know, radial compression force. So you're getting, you know, direct outward compression on the focally on the area of stenosis. And I think that this is, has been a great technique and as a means to eliminate narrow areas, although we all have done different things with the balloon. The outward pressure of the balloon can push on granulation tissue um, and eliminate vascular supply. It can break up scar tissue and be quite traumatic. And in my first uh, you know, meeting with Dr. Rudder when I was a fellow at Cincinnati, I went into the room and you know, he said, we need to dilate this patient. And I said, well, what did you dilate with last time? And he said, well, we dilated with a uh, 11 balloon um, or a 10 balloon maybe. And he, and he said, what should we do this time? I said, well, we're back in the operating room. Let's try a 12. So at that time, Dr. Cotton walked in. We, I put a 12 balloon in, and this is the first case I did with Dr. Rudder and Cotton. I blew up the balloon. I deflated the balloon. And I realized that I was actually looking into the mediastinum because I'd ruptured the airway. And Dr. Rudder kind of smiled at me and Dr. Cotton just patted me on the back and said, well, this is going to be a fun two years and walked out. So the balloon is not a, uh, a risk-free endeavor, but uh, it also did actually help that patient, uh, but that's a completely different story. So this started out using the, and this is a, a very old video, actually. This video, I want to say, is 14 years old, but it, this is a sinus balloon, and, and the sinus balloons have been adapted um, for use in the airway, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's not a, a complicated technique. You put the balloon in the narrow area, and you inflate it. There's a lot of debate as to how long you keep it inflated, what the, you know, how, how much you inflate it to what pressure, um, but again, it's quite effective. And so you see in the those a couple days after balloon dilation, you still have some surrounding trauma, um, but thereafter you actually can have a, a quite patent uh, airway. Doesn't mean you can just walk away from it and pretend like you never need to see the patient again. You need to monitor their symptoms, but the balloon again can be very, very effective. And I think we've all seen this. Um, now, the anatomy of a balloon I think is important because there are now several different models of balloon on the market. Um, there historically have been, and these are still balloons that I see uh, in the United States and abroad, uh, where you actually have two separate ports. There are compliant and non-compliant balloons. In the airway, we tend to use, um, in our practice, um, non-compliant balloons. They're very rigid and very stiff. You blow them up to their burst pressure, and, that, and, and the outer diameter listed on the balloon is what you get. You put one in an endotracheal tube and they can dilate the endotracheal tube. You can stand on it, it'll lift you off the ground. They're very strong. In contrast, there are other balloons like the Boston Scientific balloon, which are compliant. They, they actually have some squeeze to them. So you bring them up to a certain pressure, you have a certain outer diameter, you increase that pressure, the outer diameter goes up. Those are frequently used still in our practice for esophageal dilation, but less commonly in the airway. The two ports on these balloons, the Boston Scientific and the older model of Clarent balloons, have a port that actually is used for a stylet as well as um, it has a lumen that basically goes through the entire um, uh, balloon itself 
And then they have a, a filling chamber, which is the B side. And so the B stands for balloon. And if you actually put the saline in the B, you will inflate the balloon. If you make the mistake, like I've seen many, many times in my thus short career, um, if you fill the saline into to A, you're basically just doing a lavage of the lungs. And so that's not ideal. Um, the balloon catheter shaft goes, travels through the balloon in the single um, uh, lumen uh, balloons, which I can show you in a minute here. Um, those actually are, are more forgiving in a sense that the old style balloon, when you would blow up the balloon, if you put tension on it, there was a risk that you wouldn't be able to deflate the balloon. Um, and then ultimately at the very tip is where your balloon sits. So when we're trying to figure out what size balloon to use, we use the Meyer cotton grading scale and you just have to know what size your airway should be. You can look at the out, you know, age of the patient, gauge the size of the airway, look at the outer diameter of an endotracheal tube for that patient, and then know that you're likely going to increase the size of that airway by about a millimeter in the larynx and maybe two millimeters in the trachea. And that's classic, but it's not a fixed rule. And sometimes you'll start a little bit smaller and then work your way up. Um, there are certain times where you actually don't want to inflate to um, the uh, uh, above the native airway size, and sometimes this is the post-operative setting after, say, doing a laryngotracheal reconstruction. There are also certain anomalies that um, mean that you have a cartilaginous skeleton that's small, um, such as complete tracheal rings. We would not put a balloon in there at all, if possible. Uh, and then slide tracheoplasty. After slide tracheoplasty, we tend to just dilate the balloon to the size of the airway, not further, especially if you're relatively close to the, in proximity to the time of surgery. Um, you know, the, you take the balloon out, make sure that the, the, almost every balloon comes with a cover on the balloon. Uh, I've had those handed to me with the cover still on. It's obvious, but I guess theoretically you could stick the balloon in there with the cover on and that's not gonna work. You've gotta make sure that the nurse has, um, or you have the inflator um, with sterile saline basically hooked up to the correct balloon port. Um, and uh, do not test the balloon because these balloons are nice because they come very wrapped. And if you test the balloon to blow it up and just show that it works, it's really hard to get it down to that crimped profile again. You can do that if you're reusing the balloon and you wanna get it through a, a narrow lumen, you can blow up the balloon and then kind of put a little bit of twist in, on it when you're deflating it and that can rewrap it, but it's never as good as when it comes out of the package. So do your standard sizing, insert the deflated balloon into the airway, you've gotta position it and look where you're positioning it because Sometimes downstream, you don't know what you've got going on yet until you actually dilate the balloon. You have to have some idea, especially in these congenital patients who have never had any operation before, they've got a narrow airway above. It's nice if you can get a glimpse of the airway below to know that you're not dealing with a complete ring segment, for instance, that you would otherwise rupture potentially if you put a balloon in there. Um, so really know where your balloon is sitting. Bring, we bring the balloon up to burst pressure. Some people don't like to bring the balloon to burst pressure and some people will crank it uh, a la Mike Rudder a couple atmospheres higher if they feel the need. Um, you gotta hold onto the balloon, but not too tight. You, you want it to be positioned so that you're actually dilating, catching that airway stenosis and bringing it out. They wanna, they wanna tend to run down the airway a little bit. So when you, when you blow up the balloon, it will slip. Sometimes it'll slip out. More frequently, we see it distalize. And classically with the older style of Clarent balloons, people would just hold onto the balloon and it would put tension on that inner lumen. And that would actually um, create a, a situation where when you go to deflate the balloon, it doesn't deflate. And we can talk about that uh, in a moment. So once you've got the balloon up, we tend to, there's no magic time during which you keep the balloon up. Uh, I know if you're dilating the esophagus and for those who treat patients with significant esophageal strictures, we tend to you know, have a couple minutes time just because we're limiting ischemia. In the airway, we will bring the balloon up for a, a minute or two if the patient can tolerate it or when they start to desaturate, and then we'll bring the balloon down. Uh, and then put the scope back in there and look and see what you've done because sometimes you've done great things and sometimes you've caused problems. So you, you have to look and see what you've done. There's also situations where when you put the balloon in the airway, you're also gonna traverse the glottis. And with little, little infants, um, putting a, a balloon through the glottis can cause some edema that then can cause some post-operative sequela, and you just have to be aware of that. Um, many times though, that's the only place you can put it. Um, and so you have to kind of take the good with the bad as we do so many times in surgery. So um, the balloon dilation here for a tracheal scar, you got your scar tissue like before, you insert the balloon, you dilate the balloon, and, and you can see here, I'll show another picture of this, but you're actually looking through the lumen, you can see the dilation of the stenosis here. Um, you can see where it's actually blanching and usually have kind of a red rimmed halo there. And so I'll a lot of times put the camera up and look and see what I'm doing. 
Uh, when you take the balloon out, you do have trauma. Again, if you walk away from this, you probably will get some narrowing again. But when I put the camera back in, I wanna see did this kind of uh, open up the airway and cause some form of uh, scar breakdown and, and give me a lumen that's going to stay patent at least for a while? Or is it just boggy edema that's gonna shrink right back down on me? Um, when I size the airway ahead of time, I try and get an idea of the, the, even if I'm using just a flexible suction catheter, if it's very narrow, of what I'm starting with. When you're done, you're going to be pretty close to what you dilated. And so when people actually size the airway after balloon dilation, I think that measurement is a little bit less necessary, um, but it's still something that can be done um, to kind of give you an idea of how much patency you have after the dilation. Um, the ranges now, um, we have uh, uh, five millimeter balloons, which I actually use quite frequently in the kids who are you know, two kilos or a couple days old, um, and they can get quite large. So these 14 millimeter balloons um, can be used for larger children. Um, the burst pressure actually depends on the, the size of the balloon and the manufacturer. Typically, when you get to these 10, 12, 14 millimeter balloons, your atmospheres required for burst pressure are lower. Um, Brian Medical came out with a balloon, uh, which is a single port balloon, so you don't run the risk of actually putting saline down the uh, airway. Um, there really are only two possible burst pressures and they're color coded, so it's very easy to just look at the balloon and turn the crank to a specific color on the dial. Um, and they have a design where the proximal and distal ends of the balloon dilate first and they tend to dilate a little bit wider like a dog bone, um, and so that it slips less. It's not perfect, but it slips less. And, and also importantly, when you put a little tension on them, they don't have the problem that the older balloons had, wherein you aren't able to deflate the balloon, which if you can imagine in a, a patient without a tracheostomy can be a problem if you're not uh, thinking of uh, uh, ways to handle that if it occurs. Um, again, the Eclarin has the two ports, multiple burst pressures and fewer sizes. There are variations with what we do with the balloon. A lot of people will put some steroid injections and, and you know, multiple quadrants and we'll do radial incisions at that point. Um, I like to actually put these kids into suspension so I can use both of my hands, but there are plenty of times where you don't have that opportunity and working with a, a colleague or a tech, you can really get a good uh, injection, uh, incision and dilation by doing this uh, single-handedly with, with an assist. We use an injector that um, is designed to actually, it's a, a straight injector, not a curvilinear injector that you would use for an awake patient. Uh, and there are a wide variety of these. Um, other techniques would be cutting a butterfly um, needle and actually injecting with a syringe outside of the airway and, and putting the butterfly needle where you want it to go. We use Kenalog 40 as a steroid. That is something that's been around for a long, long time. It's usually available in, in most places where, where I uh, have to use it. Um, and it's, uh, I think, effective. It does form a little bit of a depot. So if you inject Kenalog, a lot of times you'll come back several months later and you'll see where the Kenalog was injected. So you don't want to over-inject. Um, arguments also come up as to whether you dilate and then inject or if you inject and then dilate. Uh, the argument for the latter is that if you inject first, you'll kind of distribute that steroid. I don't really know. I think that that's... Uh, maybe wishful thinking, but regardless, if you do it either way, you want to make sure that you actually have steroid in the tissue that you're uh, traumatizing because you want to have a reduction in scar reformation. There are also plenty of people out there, and there may be people in the audience um, who just don't feel that Kenalog injections help. So again, your practice is your practice. You have to see what works for your patients uh, and use the, those items uh, uh, in your practice. So the radial incisions, I think that the biggest point about this is that you don't necessarily need to make a full thickness incision. You can, um, but it really just sets the stage for uh, creating points of weakness that the balloon will then preferentially uh, break down the scar. You can use a blitzer knife, um, or if, if laser is something that you like to use in the airway, that's uh, uh, you know very, very acceptable. It, the only thing I tell our trainees is that if you're using a laser, you just, you know, as, as uh, Dr. Shepshe would say, you really have to cut the tissue. You're not just trying to burn it, you wanna cut it. Uh, and you know, laser in the wrong hands can cause big problems and I think we've all seen that. So the complications, and I'll be wrapping up soon and we can talk about questions or, or things that are even you know, obviously more complicated than this, but the complications are similar to anything you could see with a microlaryngoscopy and bronchoscopy. I think you have to have a plan A, B, C, and D. Um, you know, you're going to occlude the airway. Um, you may desaturate kids. If you have congenital cardiac disease, and you're gonna um, occlude their airway, you have to be ready for it, and so does your anesthetist. Uh, the balloon can get stuck in the inflated position, like I've alluded to. 
the, one of the things that I've actually done that's quite easy if you don't have a sickle knife or something sharp to poke through the mouth is you just take an angiocath, stab it straight through the neck, it pops the balloon just like that. Um, it's again, something that's gone by the wayside with the um, Brian medical balloons for the most part, um, but uh, uh, many balloons are out there which still have this potential uh, issue. So something to keep in mind. The um, wrong port, if you put the saline down there, you will uh, uh, cause some problems if you have a patient with fragile lungs. Uh, many of my patients would not tolerate a 15cc lavage. Uh, and then airway rupture. Again, I told you that I did this, uh, my first experience with rudder and cotton. Um, I've uh, seen several airway ruptures with balloons since that time. Uh, fortunately, uh, only a small, small handful uh, in my own hands. Um, but if you do a balloon dilation, you put the camera back in and you're looking at the beating heart, that tends to be a problem. It's rare, but it can be life-threatening. And kids who have a lot of scar tissue from previous cardiac surgery, many times that area is already walled off. So even with a tracheal rupture, it may not cause a huge problem. Um, if you do have a rupture, the biggest thing is to get them negative pressure ventilating. Try not to intubate them unless you can intubate beyond the site of a, a rupture and let it heal. Um, keep your breathing tubes and rigid bronchoscopes handy. Those are uh, things that we all have in our armamentarium and we've got them for a reason. So the other things that we tend to see with stent or with uh, balloons are uh, stent placement. I didn't want to expand too much on stent placement because that could be another you know, 30 minutes of talking, but um, placing stents in very specific locations like Palmaz stents, um, where the stent comes wrapped and sheathed over a balloon and you actually can place that in the bronchus, for instance. Uh, we placed a couple last week. Um, there are also times where you're taking the silicone um, hood stents and those hood stents are uh, kind of, uh, at baseline, they're open. You kind of have to fold them up and jam them in the location you want them to go but they're not always sitting completely open. And so you can put a balloon in there and just pop it open to the, the size that uh, it's supposed to be. Then when you're doing uh, posterior rib grafts, if you're ever struggling on, you know, you have, uh, you're doing this endoscopically and you've got one flange in and one flange that wants to go in, but it's not quite there. One of the fastest things you can do is just slide a balloon in, lift the balloon up and it'll pop the posterior graft in. Again, you've got to size it appropriately, um, be planning for uh, other problems. I always tend to have a suture on the piece of cartilage ahead of time. so that it doesn't run away from me. And then balloons are great for open surgical adjuncts. We just showed photos of patients who have primary stenosis, have not had open laryngotracheoplasty, but many times after we do a laryngotracheoplasty with rib grafting uh, or a cricotracheal resection, it's not perfect. And a balloon dilation here and there can actually be quite helpful. Um, it can be helpful in the immediate post-op period and it can be helpful, um, I shouldn't say immediate, it can be helpful in the perioperative period after a certain period of time passes, depending on the operation. Uh, but it can also be helpful for maintenance for these children as they grow after airway uh, surgical reconstruction. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions about balloon dilation. Um, it's uh, uh, obviously my honor to be here. Um, I appreciate it, uh, the invitation, and I'm extremely sorry that I'm giving this after no sleep for 35 hours. So, Thank you so much, Doug, uh, taking the trouble of uh, giving us this wonderful talk in spite of the fatigue of driving. Maybe your talks get better after such strenuous exercise, I do not know. So thank you very much. And we just do a little round of uh, questions because Doug may have to, um, uh, he may have to leave early. I don't know, I presume he's tired. So um, can we have uh, a couple of comments from the panelists? Um, uh, Sohit, uh, would you like to, uh, Sohit around? Can you, yeah. you Sohit? Hey, so, um, I, that was a great talk. That, uh, so just to reinforce a couple of points about balloons, uh, it's a great tool, but as Doug was mentioning, it can cause significant harm. So a couple of things, whenever you're looking at a balloon, especially in the airway, use a compliant balloon. Don't use non-compliant balloons. They are just not going to uh, achieve the target which you're looking for. Uh, the second thing is sizing is important. So just go from a small size to a bigger size. Don't go beyond two or three millimeters more than what the age appropriate airway is. There have been studies which have uh, shown you can cause uh, cricoid damage, you can cause airway damage if the size is significantly large. Um, and the last thing is, uh, uh, yeah, and I usually prefer to inject canalog first if that makes any difference. And one of the reasoning is if you create, end up creating a bleb with a canalog, with the balloon, you essentially help to spread that whole canalog evenly. Um, so I, I inject canalog first and then do a balloon dilation. 
Um, balloons are great post operatively in open airway, as Doug was mentioning, but again, you have to be very cautious when you are using it, especially in, in a PCTR patient or a slight trichoplasty. You don't want to uh, go pretty aggressive, so I would usually go, uh, I would not even go all the way up to the whole first pressure. I would keep it pretty low and I would use actually a size smaller. Um, but not go all the way high up to the first pressure. And there are various balloons available, um, uh, but always make sure it's a compliant balloon. So. Thank you, Sohit. Uh, Deepak, some quick comments? Come on. Yeah. <clears throat> so thanks, Doug. That was excellent. Um, I think he went from really basics of things uh, to how to use it. And those are really, really good points. One of the other things to keep in mind, especially because I don't know uh, if brand medical balloons are available in India or not. So I think from what I gather, there are some Indian made balloons. So it's very important. The other thing people forget is the length of the balloons. So balloons come, especially when you're using um, non-airway, non-standard <laughs> air balloons. So people use all the time. Keep in mind the length of the balloons. They come in different sizes. They come from one centimeter. Because a lot of these are taken from cardiac or pulmonary and uh, esophageal balloon dilators because they are more commonly used. So keep in mind they come from one millimeters to up to six millimeters. So typically most airway balloons are about three millimeters, uh, sorry, three centimeters. So uh, keep that in mind as well because again, as Doug said earlier, uh, you need to know where this is going because if you use too long of a ca balloon catheter, then it'll be causing damage to unintended areas. And same thing, if you're using too short, it won't give you the purpose. A lot of times, the other thing what happens is people claim, I did a balloon dilation and it didn't work. So same thing, you need to make sure you use the right balloon at the right pressure as well because if you don't do it rightly, it'll be a problem. The other thing, um, um, Sean was discussing about a patient with me a few days back. Sometimes you don't have the whole array of balloons in your department or when you need it, you don't have. So Doug, do you have any suggestions on what you would do when you have a situation where uh, say you, need, you really need a 12 millimeter balloon, but you have a 10 millimeter balloon. So how do you go about it? So it depends on the size of the airway um, and the, the size of this, the area of stenosis. There are times when we've seen um, individuals use uh, oversized endotracheal tubes, use rigid dilators, use the balloon on the endotracheal tube. Um, if the location of the stenosis is periglottic, um, I've seen people put an endotracheal tube uh, anteriorly and actually lice a posterior glottic uh, scar band and then put the balloon behind an endotracheal tube. That can also cause some trauma um, to the anterior commissure. So I you know, always warn against that. Um, but uh, I'd be interested if you have other ways of kind of maximizing um, dilation if, you, if your balloon is, is too small. Yeah, so one of the things we can do is if you take the endotracheal tube, appropriate size endotracheal tube, make some um, cuts on the endotracheal tube so it, it gives in a little bit and slide your, again, it's not ideal, but something you can do that you can place that balloon. The main thing is you need to visualize to place that endotracheal tube exactly at the spot and then put the balloon again at the spot where you want to dilate and then you can dilate. So sometimes you can uh, do that as well. Um, can I ask Sachin to get in at this moment? Sachin, your comments? Uh, great talk, uh, Doug. Uh, I just want uh, one more indication for uh, balloons is the basically posterior glottic webs or glottic webs. I think I've used in around three patients who have a posterior glottic web. Uh, balloon dilatation would tear the scar in the posterior glottis. And maybe if the balloon, uh, if the webs are uh, traumatic origin or congenital, uh, balloons may help in uh, opening the posterior glottic airway. What's your experience? Uh, so I have a couple patients um, who we dilated with posterior glottic stenosis last week. One of them had um, significant fixation of the arytenoids, and that patient has been a lot, a lot trickier. Um, and it's all require, I think, some cartilage back there to, to really be completely successful. 
but it does in fact break up, you know, even with a little lysis or a V-shaped excision of a small scar band prece um, preceding balloon dilation, it can be very effective in that area. In patients with normal arytenoid architecture and normal laryngeal uh, innervation and, and theoretically normal mobility of the arytenoids with a uh, traumatic posterior scar band, that can be effective. I think the posterior glottis is one of those areas where you can dilate and have things look great and be very functional. Um, but if you don't come back to it, it does have the tendency to kind of want to re-adhere. And so if you dilate, you want to kind of take two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward until you get to where you want to go. Uh, and I think it can be effective. But this is true for all balloon dilation. I think if you're in the operating room and you're on your third or fourth balloon dilation, you don't need to take them back for six, seven, eight, nine, ten. if you're not getting anywhere. That's a point where you have to have something else up your sleeve. Um, and we do get occasionally patients who come in after having, you know, 30 balloon dilations without any progress. And um, the balloon's great, but if it's uh, not working for uh, what you're doing, I would, ho I would hold off. But yeah, the posterior glottic stenosis, um, it can be very effective. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sachin. Uh, any other comments by the uh, same panelists? Anything you want to comment? Then we can uh, move on to the next talk and take the questions from the audience a little later. But Deepak or um, uh, Sohit or uh, Doug, if you see any questions there and you feel like responding, you can respond right away. The couple of questions, whether you inject Kinolog early, uh, before or after, I think that was answered by Doug, but maybe you could say it again in case the person didn't catch on. Uh, yeah, my, ask? myself personally, I, I do actually inject uh, beforehand uh, and, then, and then dilate. But, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Doug, before you go, can I quickly ask you, how many times do you try before you give up? In the sense, you dilated first time and you see a fairly good response. You see them back again. How many times will you try till you say, okay, this is not working? Well, I think it depends on if we're making any forward progress at all. If it looks great and I come back and, you know, if it looks great after dilation, I come back and it looks like I've never been there. I may try one or two more times, but that's about it. If I'm still making forward progress, you know, I'll probably get up to a point where you know, I think that five is probably my limit. If I'm, if I'm in there over five times with a balloon and I'm not making progress and we have other surgical options, it's hard mm -hmm. for me to justify. Um, of course, over time, I've spread out multiple balloon dilations in the same patient, but that's more for a maintenance, from a maintenance standpoint, not for the primary purpose of treating the airway. What's the interval between the dilatations? Yeah, good point. Yeah, so that's an that excellent question. So that I think also depends on what you're dealing with, what type of, what type of stenosis and, and how, uh, what you're up against with the patient's airway. For example, I had a patient uh, who was just under two kilos the other day, had congenital subglottic stenosis. We split the anterior and posterior cricoid. Um, they were on the table for a, a, a jejunal surgery and this came, they couldn't intubate the patient. So we went and took a look and realized that the you know, was, uh, airway was about a millimeter and a half and we immediately put a knife in there, split the airway, dilated until we could actually get a, the patient intubated and, and ventilated. We took out the breathing tube, split the airway um, and in the anterior and posterior cricoid and, and dilated. That patient has very little wiggle room. I'm back in the operating room with them within three or four days to see what we're dealing with. And if their symptoms dictate us going back earlier, I would go back earlier. But if I can put a week between the, each dilation, I would love to do that. So. Um, if a patient who has a relatively uh, uh, safe airway size at the end of dilation um, leaves the operating room, I'd probably schedule them anywhere from seven to 10 days later um, for your kind of standard stenosis. There are also patients who we have seen in the past and historically they don't form uh, scar quickly and we've spread those dilations out to two or three weeks um, uh, as well. So, and I know, I think you and I, Deepak, have talked about this a little bit in the past. Um, it's really easy to overdo it. And it's, it's hard sometimes to fight the urge to get back in there and look and see how well you've done. Uh, but you also have to pay attention to the patient's symptoms, but also know that sometimes a patient won't have symptoms until they're really in trouble. And th that's really true for those small babies, so. So you've done it. Sorry, so one of the things you have to look for is the, is the scar thickness as well. So if you have a very thick scar, uh, you know from the get-go, a balloon is not going to help and the uh, patient might end up getting an open airway reconstruction. So I think that's a big factor um, in, uh, in using balloons. Um, if it's a thin, flimsy scar, for me, it's anything less than a centimeter of thickness. 
that will do pretty well with the balloon. And again, it's patient dependent eventually, but the star characteristics are also very important to consider when you're ballooning patients. Um, and I saw a question about cricoid fracture, and, and that's a very uh, risky complication of balloon dilation. And one of the studies which was done way back in 2015 was an animal model in which they showed uh, if you end up uh, using a balloon slice, which is at least two or three millimeters more than the airway, then you'll end up doing a cricoid fracture. So that's why sizing of the balloon becomes pretty, pretty important uh, whenever you're using balloons. So what happens if there's a cricoid fracture? Yeah, so if you are using anything more than a 2.6 millimeter size bigger uh, than what the age appropriate airway is, you'll end up producing a cricoid fracture. But that was done in animals. Uh, but that just gives you a little bit of an idea of how uh, important the sizing of the balloons are. No, suppose you have a cricoid fracture, what, what happens? How do you manage? I think, uh, hopefully I never have it, but uh, one of the things is uh, you, I would actually intubate the child and just uh, manage it uh, in the ICU setting. Um, it, it's not going to be, the cricoid doesn't fracture like you see in traumatic laryngeal injuries. The cricoid fractures are the anterior lamina. Um, and it's essentially a dent in the cricoid. So it's as good as doing what we call as an anterior endoscopic anterior cricoid release. Uh, so you'll intubate the patient and you'll just keep him and then bring him back in a couple of days, check on the cricoid, uh, get repeated chest x-rays, look for any, any pneumonia sinus. Um, so I think, but it's always essential to avoid that complication. So again, sizing is a very important thing in business. Do you've uh, dilated the case for the first time and after that, uh, there are some uh, early indications that is not going to work. What are those that come to your mind? So I think if patients have a significant amount of edema um, in the, the glottis and subglottis, those are patients that are very tricky to manage with a balloon because you dilate the balloon and it really just kind of bogs back in on you. And, and those patients, I think that rather than patients who have more of a um, established scar, albeit possibly thin, if, if ideally, um, those patients uh, with edema, I think, are very, very tricky. Also, patients, as mentioned before, who have a very long segment of narrowing, uh, it's tough to treat longer segments of narrowing, I think, with a balloon. Not impossible, but I think you're up against a, a, a larger challenge with that. Um, and, you know, as far as the cricoid um, rupture is concerned, I haven't seen a cricoid rupture um, with a balloon um, in the, in the uh, se sense that we're not basically causing a controlled rupture of the cricoid because we do, um, again, as mentioned, perform these anterior and posterior cricoid splits. But I, I agree that if you do have that, you do want to stent the airway for a, a brief period of time. A little bit of free air in the anterior neck doesn't bother me. Doesn't, definitely doesn't bother me to have an airway um, complication in the skeleton, um, in the cervical trachea as much as it does in the thoracic trachea, but it's not ideal. Um, but yeah, the, the, uh, so the, that's kind of two separate points that I think are worth mentioning. So we'll take up the other questions as we move on and the panelists will also keep reading the questions and answer in between to save time. So do um, no words to express our gratitude for coming all the way here after this long ride and giving us this wonderful talk. Uh, please hang around, you're our uh, invited guest as long as you can. Uh, but in case you need to go and rest, um, um, we'll probably catch up with you in the subsequent episodes. And uh, I think uh, it's my, um, uh, we have some people who joined in from Nigeria and Nepal too. So we have a fairly uh, good attendance today. And uh, apart from that, we're going to uh, request you to give us feedback on these programs because that's very important to, you know, fine tune the program to the needs of the people because we have uh, aspiring every surgeons, practicing every surgeons, experts, everybody. So please, um, uh, respond to this uh, feedback form, which you can, you can keep uh, coming on the chat box. Uh, that'll give us a great deal of help. So moving on to the next part of the um, agenda, uh, we have uh, Professor Alok Tucker, uh, Professor and Head of the Department of ENT of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He's a very well-known figure um, internationally and in India, and he's going to talk to us about the role of lasers. Lasers can be very dangerous. We can cause a lot of um, complications because lasers, uh, lasers, and so we need to know how to use it, when to use it. Um, so I'm sure we'll be wiser after this uh, talk by Dr. Alok Tucker. Won't waste much more time. Uh, Alok, you can share your uh, screen. Pralad? Yeah, he's on to it, sir.
yeah you can run the slide show so good evening all yeah pleasure to be with you guys i have been uh, hearing now and then but not quite consistently in the previous episodes but i must say i really enjoyed the previous talk with dr siddle very nice so uh, great talk uh, nice to have the audience interested as you move on so my job here is to speak about uh, lasers and uh, as uh, dr raman said that uh, it can be a dangerous uh, place to be but i am going to be speaking in the little time that i have more on when to use it how to use it and not so much on the the uh, the precautions because that as is, has been said is probably another talk to go through so uh, um, lasers in the pediatric airway and uh, i would say that much of our work with lasers actually stands with the with the adult airway rather than with the pediatric i'm not quite a uh, a uh, uh, a full uh, a full time pediatric uh, otolaryngologist here and uh, much of what we do is with uh, with oncology and uh, what i am trying to show here is what we can do with the laser which basically that you can get a precise cut in the larynx which is avascular precise as i said little charring and uh, certainly when you work with oncology you sometimes have much bigger things to do than when you work uh, with laryngotracheal stenosis now uh, and this video is just to show what can be done uh, primarily uh, with the technique wherein uh, with little charring and uh, of course uh, little bleeding you can actually go down identify your structure see the cartilage take the tissues of the cartilage and have a situation wherein uh, you can have an excision with little edema subsequently and you have the confidence that because you will not get edema you can of course uh, avoid tracheostomies and avoid uh, nasogastric fees it's just a technique which is so kind to physiology it's a technique which is very kind to 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 the anatomy that you choose to leave behind or what you see there is two true vocal folds two false vocal folds moving well with the periosteum all around and which is why it sort of becomes a lovely technique to use wherever you can use it there are limitations to where you can use it but when you can it's just probably the kindest technique that you can use on the tissues and that is a few weeks later a couple of weeks later and again you can see that healing's really good no aspiration nothing to that sort so the technique is really transoral laser microsurgery it's always nice to know and the laser gives you many advantages out there some of them are demonstrated precision hemostasis as i said minimal edema and clusting if you do the if you use the laser right early post op healing and preservation of sensation and function a lot that you can get out there and because you do the transoral technique of course all of these techniques endoscopic techniques are transoral so you get good coordinated swallow and the microscope of course gives you coaxial vision and magnification so coaxial vision is very important when you're working in a small narrow airway and you can get your light to the microscope which is right uh, where you want it so it is a right in the in the right axis so uh, coming on to 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 the other lasers that exist out there really something that probably doesn't need saying but nevertheless we all know that there are many lasers out there but when i am doing this talk is primarily about the co2 laser not quite about the other lasers the co2 laser is the mucosa laser the laser to be used on the mucosa and that is of course because the co2 is uh, is one which is absorbed primarily by water and the uh, its wavelength allows uh, it to be one that is allowed that is uh, absorbed mainly by water so good for mucosal tissues that have lots of water and not so good for tissues which have lots of hemoglobin or lots of pigmented tissues so if you want to use it uh, for uh, for coagulation this is something that does work but not as effectively as other lasers which are primarily based at at uh, the wavelengths wherein the absorption is primarily by hemoglobin and by pigment which basically means the ktp lasers and the argon lasers which are basically coagulation lasers and used in ophthalmology used in the, the diode laser used in dermatology and our job is of course to use the co2 laser 
So CO2 laser gives you the prime advantage of having very minimal tissue depth, uh, tissue penetration, and many minimal scatter. So there are other uh, lasers too, which have minimal tissue penetration. They are the low frequency lasers, but they will have more scatter. So as you go high frequency, this is the highest frequency use, the laser we use, there will be minimal scatter, so minimal lateral damage and minimal deep damage. So really a laser you can control so well. And when you want to use other lasers, they have some advantages, but they do not quite have the same tissue characteristics as the CO2 laser. So what's the problem with the CO2 laser? Of course, the problem is that you can only use with the micro manipulator. There is a fiber now available, but it hasn't sort of uh, gotten too popular. I don't think it gives you the same precision. The spot size is much larger when you use it with the fiber than when you use it with the micro manipulator. And so it does limit its use uh, uh, mainly to areas which are clearly in a straight line of sight when you put in your scope through. So great for supraglottic, great for glottic, generally okay for subglottic. So sometimes you can have a little bit of issue, but as you go deeper and deeper, it's certainly an area where you start to think in terms of other technologies, maybe a flexible laser, maybe oblation, maybe micro debrider. Um, but for the supraglottis and glottis, this is a great thing to have. So now let's go down to what we use it in the pediatric airway. And certainly what we use it most is for the, the bilateral vocal cord palsy, as I said, glottis and sub supraglottic lesion. So you use it for bilateral cord palsy. And what we are doing here is doing a Kashima or a cordotomy operation where the false cord spin cut. And after the false cord spin cut, then you go on to doing the true cord. The, 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 so anyway, so the false cord has been cut laterally, and uh, then you tend to move forward in a J-shaped kind of way and feel the feel the paraglottic space muscles of the cartilage or near the cartilage. So you take your incision as for lateral to the cartilage, and then curve it a little bit forward, as you see right here, and, this, and uh, separate the anterior muscles of the vocal fold from posterior and also detach them from laterally to allow them to contract, it's basically the thyroid is going to contract and pull the vocal fold forwards. And that really is a smallish operation that you do out there. We love to do it because you can do it while uh, avoiding a trachea. So this is a child with an infant, really a 30 year old infant with uh, bilateral cord palsy with other congenital anomalies. And the choice is between a tracheostomy and doing a uh, laser cordotomy. And uh, because of the laser wherein you can be sure that, uh, so I'll stop it here. And what you can see, sorry. What you can see is the left vocal fold uh, anteriorly uh, and the space which has been created posteriorly. So the left vocal fold will retract anteriorly the tubes in place and you get enough airway to be able to extubate your child and uh, certainly you can avoid a trachea. So this uh, in the pediatric age group is probably what we would use it uh, most for. And this is the day later when you have extubated your child and uh, and you can now send the child home without a trachea. So avoidance of trachea and bilateral vocal fold palsy is one area where we would use it most. Certainly laryngomalacia is where you can use it because you can cut the aryepiglottic folds with it. And we have used this in the past to have the epiglottis pink forward and, uh, and create an airway. But you can of course also do this with other instruments including cold steel and a snip with a scissor alone. You can use it for the other, other supraglottic cysts or webs or anterior glottic webs. For the subglottis, you have to be a little bit careful. As I said, you need to have reasonable access. Most times an experienced surgeon can get there and do this uh, fairly appropriately. And uh, 
what you would tend to do is something very similar to what Dr. Siddle just showed us, which is to give three radial incisions, what we call the Mercedes-Benz uh, incision, for the obvious reason. And you give three incisions out there and then dilate with the balloon. And oftentimes you can get good success uh, with webs in the subglottis. Moving on to trachea, of course, you will have the odd patient, uh, secondary to intubation, wherein you will have a stenosis developing a month or so after the extubation. And uh, a, a, a laser is difficult to get down, a, a straight line laser is difficult to get down so deep. And um, I would tend not to take a laser down that deep. If I did, I could maybe take in a, a flexible laser, such as a diode laser, but that's not quite got the same uh, tissue interaction as the CO2 laser does, and I would generally not be comfortable about it. So this is uh, something that I've done with a bronchoscope alone, wherein you have dilated it with the bronchoscope alone. Today, of course, balloons are more widely available, and you can do that with the balloon. But I would be careful about getting a laser down there because I wouldn't be quite sure I can do this safely. What about voice, lasers for voice? So certainly for the arachnoid laryngeal papillomatosis, when you're operating for voice, I would use a laser because it's the best way to preserve uh, the architectural structure of the vocal folds and the glottis is really the, the best, uh, best modality to use. But oftentimes uh, in our situation, respiratory papillomatosis is, is presenting to you not with a voice problem, but with an airway problem. And in such situations, we can anticipate bleeding and where you expect a large volume of disease, probably better to go down with population or maybe a microdebrider. And you did so, did see Dr. Sikha speak on that a couple of weeks ago. So sometimes when you're operating for voice uh, uh, laser, and uh, of course, in pediatrics, you don't do very much of benign vocal fold, um, uh, fold work. So this is a patient who uh, has presented to us with the... Myself, Anjali, from Patla Village, Sonipat, and I am come from Patla Village, in Ames Hospital, because of throat surgery. So the obvious problem, of course, is... Myself, Anjali, from Patla Village, myself, and myself, Anjali. So the obvious problem here, of course, is that she has two low pitched voice consequent to her congenital adrenal hypoplasia. And again, in these kinds of situations, our current thought is to do the Wendler's glottoplexy, which is something we'd like to do with the laser. Again, because of the preservation of function. So when you want to work on the laser, this is your best technique. So deepitalizing the epithelium anteriorly, the basic idea is to create a web and shorten the length of the vocal fold. And uh, this is what exactly we're doing. So again, avascular uh, dissection or, uh, or, so you have created raw surfaces and then put in sutures, two sutures anteriorly to create a anterior web. So, uh, as you may well uh, remember from your physics, so to say the pitch is inversely dependent on the length of the vocal fold. And if you can shorten the length of the vocal fold, you should expect an improvement in, uh, in, in pitch. And this is an effective operation and to our mind best done with the laser. I was a student in the hospital. I had an operation in the hospital. I had an operation in the hospital. That illustrates the issue. And basically, as I said, a great tool for the supraglottis and the glottis for the obvious advantages of precision and general good coagulation, and of course, minimal edema subsequently. Some tips and tricks on what to do and what not to do. Again, the laser's been around for a long, long time. It's been around for more than 50 years, so it's not that these are new out there, but nevertheless, some lessons you learn as you go along. So on the technical side, of course, it's important to have the right instrumentation. You have to have the right scopes and you should use as big a scope you can, of course. In the supraglottis, you use a supraglottic scope and as a subglottis, it gets difficult, but if you have the right scopes, you could use it. Nice to have a scope with the inbuilt suction channel, though uh, with pediatrics, that can sometimes be difficult. And I would say essential to have uh, the suction diathermy and the suction and the, and the, uh, the suction diathermy and the 
alligator with the diathermy, the insulated uh, crocodile fossils with the diathermy, to be able to sort the bleeding issues in case you end up opening a vessel. Most commonly, of course, the branch of the superior laryngeal in the paraglottic space. So appropriate instrumentation, more than that, if there are any tips, uh, then certainly something you have to be very careful about that you should have a focused laser beam and don't quite work on anything which is not quite uh, focused. It is the precision and the sharpness of your instrument which will finally determine what kind of tissue interaction there is going to be between the laser and the tissues. And if you don't do this right, you will obviously not get the tissue uh, the, the tissue effects that you're looking forward looking for. It's nice to have tension when you cut; that's pretty obvious. Another thing that is important is to align your uh, line of sight uh, such that you can see deep down to the deepest structure that you want to work on in a great line of sight issue. The commonest problem that I have seen is that uh, as uh, you go deeper and deeper, the angle of the airway is different from the angle uh, of the of the of vision of the microscope and the laser and you, and as you go deeper you sort of tend to go out of the mucosa onto the laryngeal framework and if you tend to do that then you'll have major issues with regard to the results that you will get and complications that you will get and unfortunately i've seen too many patients refer to us who have had too many lasers and have become worse for it rather than better for it so you have to be careful that it stays on the mucosa and you don't quite get out of uh, mucosa. When I say respect cartilage, obviously means respect the thyroid and the cricoid. You can cut the epiglottic fibrous cartilage quite well with the laser. And even with cartilage, uh, certainly the pediatric cartilage uh, tolerates the laser fairly well, but the adult cartilage with, with its calcification and avascularity is bound to give rise to granulations if you're going to use the laser too much on it. So uh, use right, it's a great instrument. But the other issue that I also tend to see out there is uh, issues with regard to um, inappropriate case selection. So of course the important issue is when to use endoscopic techniques and when to use open techniques. I saw that in the chat box, this was being discussed a fair bit already. So there is a lack of clarity on it. But in our book, in general, we are very comfortable with using laser if you know that it's a soft mucosal abnormality, you know it's short segment and it's recent. And also it's uh, obviously grade one, two, maybe early grade three. As soon as you start moving beyond this, longer segments, segments which have cartilaginous involvements or uh, stenosis which has been around for a fair length of time, three, four, five months, and then you know that um, if it's post intubation, then you will be reading moving on to chondritis and maybe some cartilage um, absorption, then this is quite not the right technique to get involved with. So now if you don't choose your patients right, you're obviously not going to get the right results there. And as I said, if it's to where you need to work, then this is not a good technique. The deeper you go, the more likely you are to get out of alignment to with the exact line of where you need to work and the line of the airway. And uh, so more careful as you go deeper. And certainly vascular lesions, it's not that the laser is uh, not good for coagulation, but there's certainly far better equipment now available for coagulation. And I would certainly feel that today with the other technology that is available, probably you need to use other things for, uh, uh, for this situation. So I stop there. Thank you from me and of course from all of us in the department here at the IMS New Delhi. So thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, lovely talk, uh, Professor Tucker. It's so nice of you to have uh, accepted our invitation. So we just get a round of quick uh, responses from our uh, panelists. Uh, Sohit, um, anything you want to comment? Yeah, that, was, that, that was a great overview, Dr. Tucker. Um, uh, there are a couple of points when you're using laser and pediatric airway. One of the reasons uh, lasers never got gained uh, a much uh, a wide usage in pediatric airway was we did not have that great technology. So um, when you're using in pediatric airway, as Dr. Tucker mentioned, one of the things which is a problematic issue when you're using it mounted on a microscope is the tissue has to be in the line of axis. You cannot go off axis in use of laser. So one of the things which changed that was the flexible fiber laser. So I've been using flexible fiber laser for the past seven years of my practice. We must have done close to 200 cases with laser. And it's a great tool in the pediatric airway. 
And the reason I say that the pediatric airway, you are essentially targeting a four or a five millimeter airway through a microscope from a distance. And it doesn't give you that, and it has to be in the line of axis. If you have a tissue which is off axis, you won't be able to deal with it. So a flexible fiber laser is very important. <clears throat> the second thing, and the most important thing with laser usage is the settings and the mode you're using the laser in. So initially we were using laser in what we call as the continuous mode. And then came in the pulse mode. And that was a game changer in laser usage, the pulse mode. And even in the pulse mode, you have two types of pulses we were using. One is known as the super pulse, and other is known as the ultra pulse. For me, ultra pulse is what I call the Bentley of lasers. So if you are ever using lasers, and if you have the laser which has the ultra pulse, use that mode. That is the best mode you're going to use in, in any airway surgery, leave apart pediatric airway. And even in the ultra pulse mode, the settings matter a lot. So one of the things you want to avoid while using laser in the pediatric airway is what we call as carbonization effect. And that carbonization effect in any airway surgery for that sake. And what that entails is you're hitting the same region again and again and again and producing charring around that area. And that happens if you don't have a very sharp powerful laser. What the ultra pulse mode does, it actually is generated by radio frequency. So it's pretty high frequency laser. So you're getting pulses very rapidly. So even with a single shot, you can cut the tissue. So that's going to avoid your carbonization. The second thing you're always looking when you're using laser is what we call as the scatter effect. And the scatter means you hit the laser and the laser fiber, the laser beam actually scatters around and produces collateral damage. Again, that is one thing you have to avoid, collateral damage in the pediatric airway. And how do you do that? Again, the ultra pulse mode helps you with avoiding collateral damage because the scatter in that mode is pretty, pretty less. So, uh, and I saw somebody asking about settings. So the settings is, uh, are very important. In pediatric airway, I never go beyond five or seven or eight watts of energy. And... Uh, um, and then use it in the ultra pulse mode. And even in the ultra pulse mode, there are two types of settings you can use. One is the continuous and one is the repeat. So I end up using it in the repeat mode. Um, and there are different nuances of which tissue and which settings to use. So you don't use the same settings when you are using in the pediatric airway. Uh, if you're doing a supraglottoplasty, uh, of course you will use it in repeat mode. You want nice, smooth, uh, precise cuts. If you're using it for a, a suprastromal granuloma, you don't need that precise cuts. You can be a little bit faster. So those are nuances of laser settings, which, uh, which are very important while using in the pediatric um, airway. Um, and Dr. Tucker so, showed an excellent video of a subglottic uh, web. And one of the things to actually improve your exposure is you use a vocal cord spreader. That will give you a great, beautiful exposure of the subglottis area. Um, for tracheal stenosis, again, the flexible fiber is an excellent tool. You can, you can uh, directly pass it. They have tracheal um, hand pieces, so you can use it all the way down to the carina. Uh, <clears throat> so all in all, um, my go-to laser is the CO2 laser flexible fiber with ultra pulse mode. So I think that's a, that's a very important point to, you know, to look for when you're using the laser. Excellent uh, comments, and um, I saw Dr. Santosh Kakar's name in the audience. Thank you, sir, for uh, he uh, led the ENT department and finally the All India Institute of Medical Sciences for many years. He's an idol for all of us. We've been inspired by his uh, uh, for many years by his work, and he continues to be a very active participant in all these academic sessions. Uh, we salute you, sir, for your contributions. And wherever we are, I think it's uh, definitely partly due to you or maybe wholly part to you, depending on what kind of interaction we've had with you. Uh, can you unmute Dr. Um, uh, Santosh Kakar, please, for a minute? We are done, sir. Yes, right. unmute for me, Mr. Very well, let this opportunity go. Talk, talk. Very well presented. Thanks a lot for my comment. I usually listen whenever you people are talking. <laughs> <laughs> nice to have you on, sir. Very nice to have you on. Uh, thank you, sir. And um, uh, is Sachin uh, there? Uh, Sachin has been a pioneer in the use of laser, the legacy of Dr. Oswal. Sachin? Yeah. Uh, Your comments? Look, uh, it's an absolutely wonderful uh, talk. 
Uh, I will just I like to add few indications. Uh, one of them, of course, he has got uh, talked about supraglottoplasty in laryngomalacia. So I think laryngomalacia may be one of the uh, prime indication for using the larynx for airway problems. Another would be uh, subglottic hemangioma, and as uh, it's been pointed out, the fiber transmissible lasers. Uh, either you can use a KTP or a diode laser in non-contact mode and then all hemangiomatous lesions or a lesion like subglottic hemangioma can be dealt with uh, by transoral laser surgery. Uh, laryngeal clefts are some of undiagnosed reason of repeated aspiration and airway stenosis and that is maybe another indication for uh, using a laser in the larynx. I have used a laser for accidental corrosive poisoning. So there is always a supraglottic stenosis and again uh, fiber transmissible laser like a KTP or diode can be used for uh, these lesions. In India we get papillomas especially in the pediatric age group uh, they, and usually the children come in quite a airway distress with airway obstruction. Uh, and if you want to use a laser, then what endotracheal tube to use? That's the question. So in these cases, there is one tube called as Oswald Hunton metal endotracheal tube, which is uncuffed tube. Uh, actually, it's with me, but that's maybe uh, a laser uh, accessible tube, which can be used in uh, airways uh, if you are, want to apply lasers there. I think... Um, these are the few indications maybe I would like to add. And last not the least, if the child has an anterior web which is not giving airway obstruction, don't operate with laser. That's the maybe uh, take home message. If you use a laser for a thin anterior web in a young child, maybe one or two years of age, then it may land into a transglottic stenosis. So you have to be very careful using a laser in a child for indications which are not, not really giving quite a bit of airway obstruction. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Uh, wonderful great, comments. Great point um, about uh, subglottic hemangiomas. Um, so one of the things when you're using laser for subglottic hemangiomas is to be very, if it's a full circumferential subglottic hemangioma, you don't want to laser the whole uh, subglottis and create subglottic stenosis. So what you end up doing is doing half a side first and then letting it heal and doing the other side, if at all a laser is needed for subglottic hemangiomas. Um, laryngeal clefts lasers are great. The only issue with using uh, lasers in laryngeal clefts is if it's a revision laryngeal cleft and the tissues become pretty friable at the edges and uh, sometimes the laser is not the best uh, tool and then you end up using uh, a cold steel instrumentation. Uh, one of the things which I really like using laser is post open airway procedures. If you have a little bit of granulation tissue you can spot laser it. Um, it's easy to do. You're not pulling at tissues. You're not uh, trying to remove tissues which you don't want to remove. So uh, it's a great tool even after post uh, open airway procedures and if you have to manage granulation tissue in that way. Um, coming to papillomas, I think that was again an excellent point which was brought up. So papillomatous tissue tend to be more vascular. So a KTP is a preferred laser, but when you look at voice results, uh, it doesn't show much difference between a KTP as, uh, uh, as compared to a CO2 laser. Um, my go-to thing for a papilloma is to use a debrider, as Dr. Tucker mentioned, but when you're operating near the vocal pole, I tend to shift to a laser. So it will be a combination of a debrider as well as a laser, just to give optimal voice results. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, one question on anesthesia, I think, and we are privileged to have the presence of Dr. Uh, Jayashri Sima, who is part of our anesthetic team, a veteran anesthesiologist who's been helping us with all our airway cases. Any points, anesthetic points, Dr. Jayashri, you'd like to tell us? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raman, and uh, I feel very privileged to be on this uh, webinar. 
and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me and basically what i would like to say is if it is a case which has already has got a tracheostomy things become very simple for us but at the same time uh, if it is not a tracheostomized child and the child is holding on we would like to avoid tracheostomy and then we would like to use a nasopharyngeal uh, nasopharyngeal uh, a trumpet which is being used you know with the insufflation technique but only thing is we have to with the duration when the balloon is dilated or when there is laser we have to be taking care of the oxygen concentrations so we will have to make sure that we do not uh, exceed the oxygen uh, percentage in uh, fio to much higher so those are the few uh, little this thing and we have to be always aware of the 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 um, the fire uh, hazards and with the, with the laser in a Uh, if it is a novice uh, who is doing the case and will have to accordingly to and of course should be ready for managing any of the complications that is uh, uh, comes along with that thank you thank you jeshri uh, the cost of the uh, omni guy uh, the, the the fiber is another problem in our country that's almost 2 lakhs i think you can use it about 5 times and then there is an expiry date even if you've used 3 times and lock it up in your cupboard if the date goes it doesn't work so that is a problem with the co2 fiber that we have so we have to depending on the resources we have to use the best um now coming on to dr deepak any comments dr ramandeep uh, you have any comments on laser first starting with deepak yeah so uh dr alok made some really good pearls very good points uh, i think uh, it's very important to use the laser as a tool not as a thing to use it for everything so you need to see you need to justify why you are using the laser and you need to justify that it is way better than anything else you are using before you start using the laser number one number two again as dr uh, alok said you need to be uh, you need to know what laser you are using and when and so it made some comments as well uh, again if you have a fiber optic laser fiber one of the things uh, to keep in mind to make it more precise you need to do a near touch technique so once you touch the um, mucosa it won't be as effective and as as away you are from the point of where you want to do it will become more diffuse so you need to go really close to the uh, lesion and then start using it that will make it more precise whenever you are using the fiber optic uh, co2 laser and uh, uh about using in supraglottoplasty in the newborn supraglottoplasty the cold steel is way better uh in older kids when you're doing it because of the risk of bleeding might be more uh, the cot laser might be a better tool at that point but it's very important like um like it was said earlier you need to see where you are doing it you need to be in the line of where the laser is going uh to use whatever whether you using in the supraglottic or the glottic lesions you can use the uh, uh micro manipulator but when you're using beyond and if you're using you need to be seeing what you're doing so can i sort of come in because uh, i mean it's nice to have dr mehta and dr sohit here both with the experience on the fiber i have uh, used the fiber a bit but didn't get too much joy from it uh primarily because as you said uh, um the precision that you get with the micro manipulator i find it difficult to replicate with with the with the fiber so and i would say that where you can get the micro manipulator focus nasal beam i would rather use that be the supra glottis and glottis and of course where you can't get it then the the uh, then the fiber is a is is an option uh as are other fibers but my problem with it is that it's a divergent beam so i mean as you said if you 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 go a little bit too far and then it diverges and it's not quite such a uh, cutting thing and you get too close and it touches and then it chars your tip and you just keep struggling uh, you know with it so uh, so it uh, what would be your uh, practice for supraglottic and glottic would you use the micro manipulator or would you use the fiber so um initially uh, using the micro manipulator because we just did not have a co2 laser in the ultra pulse mode in the flexible form um and that was one of the reasons we used the micro manipulator and again the whole issue with the micro manipulator is if any all our cases are done in a spontaneous respiration so if the baby moves or if the baby bucks or if anything happens you lose that line of vision 
and you again have to go back and set up the whole laser. Um, the, uh, we actually did a study where we compared our cold steel supraglottoplasties with laser supraglottoplasties. And our, our end point was to first of all see if there was any higher chance of uh, supraglottic stenosis versus the time taken for both the procedures. So if you look at that, the time taken was pretty similar for doing cold steel using your micro scissors versus laser. But the time when the child was suspended was significantly less with the laser because once you do the laser, there is no bleeding. You just desuspend the child, you're done. You're not holding an African pledges in the airway for a minute or two with the child bleeding spontaneously. And I actually had a case where the child uh, had a cardiac arrest on the table. He was a cardiac child. And uh, I think our plane of anesthesia was a little bit lighter and he aspirated a little bit of blood and eventually went into live spasm and cardiac arrest. Um, so my whole point with the, it's a great tool, you're right, the precision you achieve with the micromanipulator is, is, is not comparable to what you're going to get with the flexible fiber, but the maneuverability you achieve with the flexible fiber laser is not what you're going to get with the, uh, using the micromanipulator. So, yeah. so I've used it extensively in pediatric airway, right? and I've used it for any conceivable pathology. And um, again, the cost is a big effect. So the cost is a huge thing when you're using the fiber. So our, our fibers are disposable. We use it once and then we're done essentially. Um, and again, there is, a, as Dr. Raman mentioned, there is a, there is a limited number of times that you can reuse those fibers, even if you're planning to reuse it. So I agree, the cost is a factor when you're trying to use it, but the micro manipulator itself is pretty expensive. So if you're investing in a laser, uh, the whole micro manipulator is a separate piece of equipment you're going to buy, and that's also very expensive. So, thank you very much, and I think we should move on now. Uh, we have uh, the next speaker, Dr. Ramandeep, and uh, we'll keep answering the questions meanwhile. Uh, Professor Ramandeep is from the prestigious uh, Postgraduate Institute from uh, Chandigarh, and um, He's been a major advocate from what little I've um, read about him of, uh, of uh, the coagulation. So let's you see how well this tool complements um, our uh, approach to the pediatric airway. Uh, yes, I'll just join you. I'm just going to get the slideshow started. Start from the first slide. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of stuck. Yeah, Bulldog. Okay. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I am uh, Randeep Gwir. Uh, I work in the Department of ENT at uh, PGI Chandigarh. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. E. V. Raman and Dr. Pralad for including me in this esteemed panel of speakers. Uh, my experience, of course, is uh, nowhere uh, compared to some of uh, the doings of uh, airway uh, surgery who have uh, spoken today. And uh, uh, so I'll basically uh, basically be speaking on uh, coblation in the pediatric airway. So uh, we'll start with what exactly is uh, coblation. So coblation or plasma ablation, as it is also known, uh, what exactly it is. So when we know that when liquid vaporizes, it forms gas. And when gas ionizes, it forms plasma. So plasma is an ionized gas and it consists of three electrons, ions, and excited radicals. So what does coblation do? It generates a sustained plasma layer, which is used to remove the target tissue while minimizing damage to the surrounding area. So it is made up of these two words. It's basically controlled ablation. So they took the CO from the controlled and the ablation from the ablation, and it stands for controlled ablation. Uh, we basically uh, go through a briefly, uh, what is the science of the plasma ablation? Basically we have a wand, then we have saline irrigation. Then we have a controller, uh, which gives voltage. And then the coblation uh, switches on and plasma is formed. So what does saline do? Saline just serves to form an electrical path. Coblation is a bipolar tool. And we need a saline to form an electrical path between the primary and the secondary electrode. So what does the voltage from the controller do? Where it ionizes the gas and it creates plasma. And then what does the plasma do? It causes tissue breakdown and the byproducts are light and low heat. So basically, coblation is not a heat-driven process. Many times I get asked the question, no, we can see light, we can see smoke. 
so light and low heat are by products of the tissue breakdown they are not uh, the cause of the ablation wound itself uh, these are the different type of wounds that are uh, available uh, so we have an active electrode like i said it's a bipolar device then we have a secondary uh, electrode or a return electrode as it is called and then we have saline delivery channels through which saline is delivered over the tissues and over the tip of the wound we have a suction port after the tissue breaks down it is sucked into the port now we come to what type of wounds we use for airway doing the coblation adenoidectomy is very different than working on the airway the lengths are different the diameters are different so basically for airway surgery we use two kind of wounds the first is called the pmlw or the precise mini laryngeal wound the length is 19 cm it has a narrow 2.8 mm diameter at the end and it is bent up 16 degrees at the tip so as to enable us to work comfortably in the trachea the glottis and the subglottis then we have the plw plw is a larger version of an mlw it's called the precise laryngeal wound and it has a 3.8 mm diameter and 15 degrees angle at the tip so the main difference between the two wands i will show you the top one is the micro laryngeal wand that has just one single electrode now this kind of wand is good for giving incisions uh, for sharp work and the lower down is the precise laryngeal wand it has a bigger electrode this wand is basically used for debulking okay so the, the, these are the two uh, laryngeal wands or the airway wands that are available in coblation what have we used uh, the coblation in the airway for and the surgery is being regularly performed at our institute uh, we use it for removing tracheal masses tracheal tumors granulation tissue we have used it extensively for tracheal stenosis both pediatric and adult in adults we use it in vocal polyposis in the pediatric age group we do use it for juvenile onset recurrent papillomatosis and posterior transverse chordotomy uh, for bilateral vocal fold palsy we use it for supraglottoplasty for laryngomalacia we use it in valvular cysts and of course adenoids and tonsils which um, uh, has already been discussed in a previous webinar so the adenoids and tonsils i will not be discussing in this so what is the technique we use we use a laryngoscope with a miller's blade and then we use a 2.7 or a 4 mm nasal endoscope attached to a hd camera so the assistant sits at the head end he holds the assembly and the endoscope is put through the miller's blade leaving the surgeon's hand free for instrumentation so basically it's a team work two people are uh, operating on the airway so this is a picture of uh, how we do it this is a laryngoscope that's the miller's blade which is attached miller's blade is a straight blade which has a groove in it the endoscope goes through it it is attached uh, to a high definition camera and you can see on the top left the image we get so we get a wide panoramic view and it is not limited by the uh, limits of a normal laryngoscope which we use for laryngeal surgery but that being said i have to tell you that for longer surgeries we use a suspension laryngoscope but for shorter surgeries and as our surgical skill level and our learning curve has narrowed and our surgical skill level has improved the same surgery which used to take us 30 to 40 minutes we have been able to drastically reduce the time taken now and we can operate with this kind of uh, setup uh, this technique has already been published in the indian journal of otolaryngology so the uh, viewers and whoever is watching if they need to know the detail of all how this uh, setup is done can uh, read this article which is available online so the first uh, we uh, i'll be discussing a valvular cyst so valvular cyst uh, usually uh, you know we get a call from the pediatrics a patient had come in with respiratory distress they got the imaging done and it showed a valvular cyst uh, we again use the same procedure the anesthetist uh, intubates uh, the child and uh, we uh, use a miller's blade put in the endoscope you can see the miller's blade is already inside and we take the endoscope through the miller's blade and we are right on to the valvular cyst now we insert a wand and the good thing about the wand is that it can be bent to reach difficult anatomical area so if you are having trouble reaching it you can bend the wand and we use the ablation mode so you ablate the surface away and once the cyst opens the content ruptures now the good thing is the wand also has a suction in it so you don't need to put a separate suction the contents are uh, aspirated away uh, you make sure the lining is adequately taken away to prevent a recurrence 
So once the cyst has been opened, the contents has been aspirated, the cyst wall is being taken away. If there is any bleeding, the coagulation has a coagulation mode in it. So you take the wand up to the tip, press it for a few seconds, and it is a bipolar cautery in itself. It takes care away of the bleeding. So make sure the cyst wall is adequately removed. It doesn't take more than a few minutes. This is an unedited video and that completes the procedure. So you can see the, uh, the cyst was arising from the right hand side. It was also evident uh, on the uh, uh, scans, the uh, radiology which had been done and we have taken it away. Uh, we have published our work on neon, um, uh, neonatal vallicular cysts and endoscopic cystic coagulation of congenital vallicular cysts. Uh, uh, two, uh, two articles have already uh, been published and they are available uh, online. Then we use it for tracheal masses and granulation. Now granulations, tracheal masses, they can get very messy and they can cause a lot of bleeding which the child can aspirate causing trouble. Now the advantage with the coagulation which we have seen is that there is lesser or minimal bleeding and if there is bleed, you don't need to take in a separate tool to stem the bleed. You can just switch on to the coagulation mode, which is just pressing another pedal and the bleeding can be controlled. So we are doing the same procedure, same way. Uh, Miller's uh, uh, laryngoscope blade from the top, the endoscope goes from the top. This child has already been tracheostomized. So we bend the wand and introduce it through the tracheal opening or the tracheostomy opening. And the granulation is taken away. You'll be able to notice the minimal bleeding and minimal charring also since the temperatures don't rise above 40 to 50 degree Celsius. Uh, we've all, uh, always also uh, removed a fibro, uh, myofibroblastic tumor of the trachea with this technique. The other thing which we are routinely using it is in tracheal stenosis. Now, uh, Dr. Alok has already spoken on lasers in tracheal stenosis. Uh, Doug spoke with the balloon. So like all of them said, all these are tools, right? They will, uh, you know, make it easier for you to operate, but the patient selection is most important. If you think you have a grade four stenosis and uh, you do, you're going to do a laser or a balloon or a coblation and it is suddenly going to disappear, you are going to be disappointed. So patient selection has to be appropriate and Tools are available depending upon what the surgeon is comfortable with. Uh, this is a child and we are using a micro laryngeal wand, which is the sharp wand with a single electrode. Again, uh, in this case, since uh, it was uh, taking us longer, we had a suspension laryngoscope, as you can see. Uh, so the endoscope is uh, threaded along with it. And this is a micro laryngeal wand, which has a 2.8 millimeter diameter. And we gently open up the sten uh, stenosis. Now, I don't use the balloon, but we use gentle uh, dilatation with the bougie to get better results. So once the uh, uh, segment has, uh, the stenotic segment has been taken away, it was a softer uh, stenosis. Uh, you know, uh, we used a gradual dilatation and then uh, any bleeding which is occurring can be taken care of just by zapping it with the coagulation mode. Again, the key here is don't expose the cartilage, don't uh, go overall, um, you know, don't go all out, uh, burning everything that you uh, see in the middle. And of course, avoid touching the posterior part. Uh, this is the post-operative uh, bronchoscopy of the patient. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is post-operative six weeks. The area is well healed. Uh, you still can see some amount of narrowing, but if this kind of airway is consistent with the lifestyle of the patient, we would not tend to overdo or take in this patient again. Like if it is, let's say if it's an old patient and it was a grade three stenosis, you have made it into a grade one and the patient has, doesn't have a very active lifestyle or is not going to run a marathon, leave it. You know, if the patient is happy, can do his daily work, daily routine, don't be a cowboy surgeon. Don't go all guns blazing, thinking that I'm going to make the trachea as it was completely a round tube as it was before uh, whatever happened, which caused the stenosis. So case selection and what expectations of the patient are very important. 
uh, we published this in otolaryngology head and neck surgery plasma ablation assisted endoscopic management of post intubation laryngotracheal stenosis an alternate tool of for management so this is not a replacement tool it is an alternate tool for things which are already available like dr alok said and sohit has already beautifully explained about the carbon dioxide laser and the fiber so this is one of the alternate tools that is available the reason we called it an alternate tool was laser like uh, sohit said is very expensive in even in india very few centers will have a good carbon dioxide laser uh, we have it at pgi dr alok has it at aims a few of the private practitioners have the carbon dioxide laser but it is a tool which is not easily accessible and available whereas a uh, uh, coblation uh, as an instrument nowadays because of its use in adenoid and tonsil is very commonly available so for a country like us if we can adequately train the surgeons on this tool the it's cheaper it's easily available the cost is uh, you know 100th of what a laser machine is going to cost you so it can be a alternate tool for management uh, supraglottoplasty was also discussed uh, there um, uh, so it had already mentioned between cold and uh, carbon dioxide laser uh, we uh, do the supraglottoplasty for laryngomalacia with uh, the coblation so preoperative and postoperative fiber optic bronchoscopy is always done by our pediatric pulmonology colleagues they are the ones who refer the case to us uh, they have already done the fiber optic we just go in with a uh, similar method which i had explained before so this is a picture of a preoperative uh, case of laryngomalacia you can see the omega shaped epiglottis uh, and it is falling back towards the posterior pharyngeal wall So this case was taken up for supraglottoplasty with a coblation. So same thing, Miller's blade. The endoscope is threaded through the Miller's blade. You can see the short AE folds, the omega-shaped epiglottis. After the anesthesia team has intubated the patient, we take in a wand. Again, I'm using a micro laryngeal wand with a single electrode because I want minimal damage. When we started doing uh, this procedure, I'll be very honest with you. The first case we overdid it. We got carried away. That I have to create more space. the patient had nasty aspiration post operative of course which settled down with diet and postural feeding but yes uh, the patient did get it so don't overdo it you can get a second chance but if you overdo something you cannot reverse it so have that dictat with you when uh, you uh, go up on a surgery don't overdo do whatever is required in case uh, more time is uh, needed or another procedure is needed you always have a second chance to go in Uh, you cut the ae folds both sides as you can see there is no bleeding even if the bleeding occurs you have a coagulation mode like i said which takes care of the minor bleed which can occur but ablation itself seals the small blood vessels bigger vessels will not be sealed by it but small blood vessels it will take care if there is any redundant mucosa that depends on the uh, you know the grade of uh, laryngomalacia you can just zap it away and that should serve the purpose So again uh, this uh, is an unedited video as you can see it doesn't take much time it's a very clean surgery uh, your view is fantastic you are right up there it's a panoramic view you have a suction irrigation uh, coblation and coagulation in a single wand and if you are having difficulty reaching up there you can bend the wand so that completes the procedure this is the post operative picture so you can see i have paused the video you can see the ae fold which has opened up this is 10 days post op so see the lack of slough formation and charring it heals very well because the thermal collateral thermal damage is very very minimal because of the low temperatures this is the right side ae fold that is the epiglottis and you can see it is not touching the posterior pharyngeal wall anymore it has opened up and has moved anterior so this is another uh, condition we have used it in but that being said i only use coblation in the lower airway below the cords if we have uh, uh, recurrent uh, papillomatosis in the trachea or the bronchus that is where i use it personal preference i say personal preference because i haven't done a study comparing a laser with a coblation and uh, um, a skimmer on the vocal cords but personal preference for the vocal cords it's still the skimmer for working on papillomatosis limited to the uh, vocal cords but if there is anything lower down i will tell you why i use the coblation so this is a patient we had 
extensive recurrent papillomatosis. Uh, the patient was already tracheostomized when he was referred to us. Completely, uh, the glottis was completely closed. Once uh, we were done with the uh, glottis, we thought, uh, you know, uh, there'll just be a little bit of uh, papillomatosis lower down. But we were surprised to see what was actually there. What you can see now is we are working through the glottis and we cannot even see the tracheostomy tube. After removal of a lot of polyposis, the tracheostomy tube comes into sight. So that whole area was full of papillomatosis. Once that was done, we moved the tracheostomy tube away with the help of a cublation wand and removed the disease lower down. We thought we were done, but no, we were not. There was still a massive chunk lower to the tube. We went deeper in and we saw more papillomatosis. Then I introduced the wand through the tracheostome. We bent it about 40, 45 degrees to enable us to reach lower down in the trachea. Once that was done, we took a look in the left bronchus and we again saw disease. Again, using the endoscope, we bent the uh, publication wand a little more and we were able to take away the disease from the bronchus. So this is how it looked after we were done with the trachea. Uh, this is an edited video. It must have taken me a few hours of struggling, cleaning. Uh, this was also at our initial stage when we were still in the learning curve of using this tool. And we were using the older EVAC 70 wand, which has a tendency to get blocked frequently. This is a post-operative video of the same patient. This is a month uh, post-operatively, six, I think six weeks post-operatively. And you can see the unhealthy mucosa. You can still see the whitish patches which are there. But the disease has been cleared completely. So this is the uh, endoscope going up. And the patient was disease free. Now, that being said, we have had to repeat, uh, have had to do repeat surgeries on this child umpteen times after that. But the lower trachea, I still handle with the cublation. So uh, we have also published um, uh, pediatric supraglottic stenosis, which was secondary to uh, aspiration uh, uh, of uh, green chilies and uh, other uh, chemical which the child took. Uh, we've also uh, published that. Then we have also done uh, congenital clotic web using plasma ablation and uh, with a spot of fibrin glue so that the two raw surfaces don't uh, come uh, in contact. I have a video, a small video of the procedure, but uh, this was done right before the lockdown. The follow-up bronchoscopy was done by the pediatric pulmonology. Uh, I could not get hold of that. So this is what we found, same technique as before, Miller's laryngoscope blade and a four millimeter endoscopic going in and we saw a web, a congenital web. So again, using a micro laryngeal wand, you cannot use a bigger wand here because of the collateral spread of plasma, which will uh, form. It is more circumferential, you don't want that. And the patient had a bifid epiglottis also. So make sure uh, there is nothing lower down. Check for, uh, uh, you know, any tracheal stenosis, which can be there. So don't overdo it. Um, you know, we didn't uh, take it right up till the tip. Uh, you don't have, like I said, don't have to overdo it. Go lower down, uh, look into the trachea for any other anomaly that can be there. There was none. And we put a drop of uh, fibrin glue, which we use for CSF and pituitary surgeries. Uh, onto the onto the vocal cord, and the child has done exceptionally uh, well. So, uh, coming to the end of my talk now, I know I must have overshot how much I have spoken. Uh, what are the advance advantages of cublation? If someone asks that, no, you know, laser can also do this, or cold steel can also do this. So, basically, working in confined spaces, it is a single tool in which we have suction, irrigation, cublation, and coagulation. So, in narrow spaces, in pediatric airways, and of course, in nasal cavities, uh, where the space is limited, this can be an advantage. Uh, it is perfect, like I said, for narrow spaces of the pediatric airway. The good thing is the wand is malleable, which makes it advantageous to hit difficult anatomy. Like that case in which the disease was going in the left bronchus, 
I seriously don't know if uh, I did not have the collation tool, uh, with what instrument would I have hit that area, removed the disease and uh, had uh, coagulation abilities also. And the other advantage is the lower temperatures. Uh, the maximum temperatures reach a 70 degrees Celsius, minimum 40 to 70. This limits collateral thermal damage. Uh, a few pearls, there is a learning curve and it's steep. Okay, so proper training is mandatory for this uh, uh, because it's a relatively newer technique. A relatively newer means, I mean, it's not been around for like 20, 30 years. So there is learning curve and proper training has to be there. The tool is not a magic wand. Like Dr. Alok and uh, Dr. Sohit and uh, Doug and uh, Dr. Deepak have already said, patient selection is very important. Okay, this will not replace lack of training and wrong selection of parent, patients. And in airway surgeries, the first chance is usually the best. So we have to learn to choose carefully. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk. You kind of wrapped it up. Uh, let's, um, uh, I, I need to invite a couple of people who have already joined. Uh, we welcome uh, uh, Dr. Yogesh from Nepal. He was the chief organizer of the SARC meeting, unfortunately, because of the COVID thing, it couldn't be held. We were looking forward to visiting Nepal. Then uh, we also uh, would like to um, welcome Dr. Sonika Kanutra, sister of uh, Sohit, who's uh, joined us. And uh, we welcome you, madam. It's nice she to have you here. Raman and, says she was my colleague in uh, post-graduation. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. wonderful. <laughs> and uh, we would also like to invite uh, one of our uh, expert panelists, uh, Dr. Kishore Sandhu, who had a preoccupation, he was away, so he's joined us. And he's been one of the pillars of our 19-year-old um, uh, airway center in Bangalore here. And uh, we welcome him. And can somebody unmute uh, Dr. Kishore so that uh, we can just quickly hear his comments on... Uh... Kishore, are you there? He has to unmute himself, sir. He's unmuted. Kishore, unmute yourself. Yeah. yeah. Kishore, uh, the first talk, uh, because Duke had, um, you know, the rearrangement, Duke spoke on balloons in the pediatric airway. Uh, after that, Alok spoke on uh, lasers in the pediatric airway. And of course, we had Ramandeep on coagulation. I think with your experience, you can probably uh, say a few words or sentences about each one of them, where you would put them in your shelf in the pediatric airway. No, I think I just, uh, in fact, you know, heard uh, Ramandeep's, uh, Ramandeep's uh, talk and it was fantastic. It was really, really nice and congratulations on uh, some wonderful work and, uh, you know, wonderful results. I think they were really, really nice and interesting. Um, unfortunately, I was not there for the first two talks, but, you know, I think, you know, I'm sure, you know, you guys have covered everything and, you know, Doug has spoken and, you know, Alok has spoken already. And uh, so it has sort of, you know, contributed along with, of course, our very own Deepak. But just a couple of things, you know, with, um, with balloon dilation, I think two things which I think are important is, are the, the, the tools that we use to inflate the balloons. Now, there are basically two types of tools that we use to inflate a balloon. Yes, I'm aware of all the kinds of balloons in the market, but I think the two tools that we use to inflate are basically the plunger syringe manometer type and the second one is basically something like, uh, in fact, it's a syringe pump that you use basically to inflate the balloon. To me, the plunger type of uh, device that is there, you have absolutely no feedback or you know the tactile feedback. So that would mean that you know if you have let's say eight millimeters or ten millimeters or whatever it is, you know, unfortunately, you hit into that eight or 10 millimeters, and probably, you know, you might end up having a collateral damage. Having said that, yes, whilst you're plunging that, that balloon uh, with, uh, with normal saline, it is possible that, you know, it doesn't go beyond a certain time, certain sort of, you know, pressure, and probably you could avoid uh, the collateral damage. But to us, I think the syringe pump device is what actually we use which the Boston scientific people are actually proposing. And, you know, we have been using it for the last many number of years. I think it really gives you a good uh, tactile feedback and you can stop when you want to stop. And if the balloon is just not going to go, so all kinds of collateral damage can be avoided. I think the second area, as far as, you know, my balloon 
experience is concerned is those children or those patients in whom uh, exposure is not possible, typically Pierre-Robin syndrome, temporomandibular joints, which are fixed, etc. So those who cannot be suspended, you know, are the trick uh, patients. And in them, in fact, you have to go in with a flexible endoscope. Again, a flexible endoscope, which is going to take the balloon size, meaning you can't go in with a size 3.1 or a 3.8 millimeter, whatever flexible endoscope you're taking. Uh, it has to have the right size that is going to have a right working channel to get into the airway uh, so as to do the right job. Um, what else? I think, uh, you know, as far as the laser is concerned, you guys have really, you know, taken up the, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it must have been well discussed. But to me, I think, you know, finally, all these things are tools, no matter what we are doing, whether it is the laser, whether it is cold instruments, uh, whether it is, you know, um, the coablation, I think the bottom line is uh, one needs to realize that you want to avoid uh, collateral damage. And the first shot that one takes at the airway stenosis has to be your best shot. Because once you, know, you have got a damage done, believe me, it is going to be a little tricky. Adults, it's a different ball game because you have a, perhaps a larger uh, margin of error. To me, children, maybe children who are less than one year of age, you know, who undergo, you know, open airway surgeries um, are a trick sub a subcategory of patients where the first um, decision making is very, very critical. So I think uh, no matter what tool you use, uh, it is extremely important to uh, get it right the first time because later on salvage procedures can be quite painful and distressing. Thank you, Kishore, for your comments. Uh, any quick comments from our other panelists? Uh, we'll start with Deepak. Is he here? Deepak, anything you want yeah. to say about coablation? Yeah, so um, great points. Again, I'll just lay, um, I just give a warning to uh, the younger colleagues who are just starting into airway. So these are done, like Ramandeep, Alok, they've been doing this for years, okay? So just don't go there starting off saying, I should be using laser for this because Dr. Alok Taka said you should be using or Ramandeep said we should be using, we shouldn't be doing that. You need to say, am I doing the right thing for the patient? And like Kishore very rightly said, it's your first shot is your best shot and do it rightly. Once you cause the damage, it's a lot more difficult to fix it. So it's very, very important. This is the most important point we need to take is don't do it for the sake of doing it. Um, the only place I really use the coblation in the airway is mainly for tongue base lesions or when I'm reducing the tongue base, it is way better than most other things uh, out there. Um, so when you are reducing the tongue base, if you are taking out the lingual tonsil or you are reducing uh, for patients who have tongue base collapse and compromising the airway, that's the only place I personally use the coblation. Uh, for anything else, for me, there are other tools out there which work equally well and it is more controlled in my hands. Sachin, any quick comments? Yeah, it was a wonderful talk from uh, Mr. Virk and I really enjoyed indications and malleability of the probe that is what is important and it differentiates from other tools which are really available so he was able to treat lesions quite down in the airway from the tracheal stoma and that is uh, maybe a good indication for uh, using uh, copulation in airway stenosis it was a wonderful uh, talk actually i use maybe ktp laser in the similar conditions but yes those who have it and are used to uh, handle it very well uh, tool to use that yes so uh, any comments yeah i would like to congratulate uh, dr raman that was uh, that might be one of the largest series of uh, coagulation in the airway i've actually ever seen and uh, he has actually treated uh, almost all common airway pathologies using the coagulator which is again a great tool uh, but to echo what uh, deepak was saying uh, it is a dangerous tool so um, I, the, the technique which uh, Dr. Wirt described about using it with the Miller Blade, I want to encourage the younger uh, trainees or younger physicians to do it 
if you want to dwell on the correlation, please suspend your child. Uh, and then you have wider exposure, you have much better control. Uh, use the smallest blade possible. You don't want to produce collateral damage in a small pediatric airway. Um, it's a great tool, especially in the Indian setting because you don't have laser available uh, universally, but you have to be exceptionally cautious. Um, and again, as Deepak mentioned, one of the things I use it for in the airway is the lingual tonsillectomy and basal tongue reductions. Um, it's, a, it's a great tool to do even some epiglottic pexy work. So if you want to demucosalize the epiglottis while you're doing a lingual tonsillectomy, it's a great tool. You'll end up demucosalizing the epiglottis with the same tool. Uh, but again, it's a tool and it has to be used cautiously uh, in much stable hands uh, before dwelling on it. We always like to um, uh, encourage innovation and also younger talent. So we have uh, Dr. Deepa Shivnani, who's a, a fellow with us. Uh, she has her own take on what she has heard today. She's going to kind of um, try her own way of summarizing uh, today's uh, talk. And uh, after Deepa finishes, we still have a lot of time. We will answer questions and have asked the expert. And we've got some eminent people attending this conference. Uh, Shashidhar, Rakesh, Ezi, Naina, Anju, Tiru, Dr. Mary, and Ajoy. I'm sure we'd like to get some more uh, feedback from all of them, apart from the experts who are already there. Deepa, you go ahead. Deepa, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Thanks a lot. I'll just quickly start my presentation. We have already discussed about the uh, micro debrider in our previous session where we discussed uh, during the job cases uh, management. Then we have discussed about the laser, the balloons and the coagulation extensively. Now I want to share our experience on pediatric airway management and how to get the right fit, which instrument to be used and where. Then. Um, Okay, I'm sure that one of you have, must have faced this condition when you are almost ready with your airway case and your trolley and the moment you start the case, you'll be missing out something and you'll be waiting for the sister to arrange those. And that is not the time where child is already incubated, anesthetized and in spontaneous breathing and you are waiting for probably for the cottonite or some balloons or the palms or something else. So to avoid this, we have created our own checklist where we have kept everything like from starts from bowel with the normal saline to the laser and debrider uh, setups this is very important to prepare yourself before you ship the child to the theater so as you can see we have included the kinocord injection steroid mitomycin we keep almost everything ready because you never know which kind of surprises you will get once you scope the child. We keep airway balloons, not only the balloons, the metal dilators and bougies also ready, the tracheostomy set, the tubes, and, and uh, not even the cotinoid, the patties, the gauze piece and ribbon gauze. Because sometimes if the bleeding is less, you can manage with cotinoids. But if bleeding is more for like debulking tumors and all, you may need ribbon gauze. So you cannot wait for the sister to, uh, you know, get it and arrange the ribbon gauze that time. And then comes the recording system monitor, microscope, laser, debrider, and coagulation device. And we make sure, once I say, Dr. Raman, that okay, everything is ready, checklist is ready, things are working, then only he says, okay, shift the child into OR. So the lesson learned, preparedness is important. It's, it's if you take more time to prepare your theater before shifting the child, then your time for the surgery will be pretty less. So better you be prepared for everything uh, which comes in your airway case management. Then we have discussed about all the instruments. So which uh, means these are the major you know, instruments and gadgets for our airway surgeries. So which instruments do you choose for particular case? Okay, some may say for subglottic stenosis, we'll straight away go for the balloon dilatation or the laser directly. But unless you scope the child, you never know what kind of surgery you are going to perform. And as everybody in saying here, that first chance is the best chance. So better be ready with everything. So the decision making while you do 
uh, the surgery, I'll uh, share our experience with one case, a six years old female child who, who met with RTA and developed head injury, no external and trauma to the neck and emergency rapid intubation was performed. And uh, there was difficult extubation total for three attempts and finally this child was tracheostomized and referred to us for, for the management. Clinical diagnosis of you know, intubation injuries or subglottic stenosis was made, but when we scoped the child, this was the presentation. We found that this child is having posterior glottic stenosis type 1 grade, where there is a thick band between the vocal cords, and lower down we found the subglottic stenosis. So basically, we are dealing with two pathologies in this one case. So what, uh, what tool would you choose for such kind of cases? So we have everything. As I told you, we, we kept very cold cut, laser, coblation, balloons, rigid bougies, and the micro debrider. So let's take one by one. Initially, for this presentation, we, we could have used laser also, but we went with cold cut instrument. We used the laryngeal uh, scissor and cut this bend. And as you can see, just took a few seconds to manage this problem here. And, but lastly, you can see there are some thick bands laterally, excessive tissue is remained. We said, okay, we'll, do, we'll deal uh, this later. We went to the second problem of the subglottic stenosis and we use size eight balloon. We have already discussed uh, about the balloon in detail. So I won't tell much here. We use Aries balloon of size eight. We inflated this for two minutes and total two applications we performed. And after this, this was the presentation. Once it is done, we again went back to the upper uh, leftover problem and we used uh, coblation MLW wand here. As uh, you know, it's, it's already clear that it's up to you. It's up to the surgeon which device he wants to choose whether the balloon or the micro debrider coblation or the laser. The idea is we have to debulk this excessive tissue here and create the space uh, which has been caused by this band. And uh, so you can see in one single case, if we are ready, we can use the best available option according to the surgeon's skill. In one single case, we use the cold cut instruments, we use the balloons and we are using coblation device altogether. After two weeks of uh, uh, this uh, procedure, we again took the child for evaluation and we found that the posterior bend was completely gone. Just minimal uh, thin scar was there behind, but the vocal cords were mobile and the uh, voice, uh, uh, voice was the good. And uh, lower down, you can see we again got the uh, subglottic stenosis, where again we performed the same balloon dilatation with eight size balloon, two minutes, inflation and two application consecutively and here is the video of the child in less than 24 hours of the surgery of the voice uh, quality so the lesson learned, be ready for the worst. It's not only about the airway surprises, it's about the sometimes child may end up into the tracheostomy, so you have to be ready for the tracheostomy, or sometimes child may go for the, uh, you know, longer duration of intubation uh, post-surgery for four to six hours. So you have to ready for that. Then the availability of your resources, the accessibility of the instruments, affordability of the patient. If we would have used the laser there, the bill you know, would have gone a little higher side, but we use the cold cut instruments to cut short the bills. So affordability of the patient, and then most importantly, the surgeon's skill. Then uh, next come, which instrument is superior? Okay, we are not going uh, to talk about the straightforward condition like uh, the laryngeal papilloma where we know the debulking is required so debrider will be superior than the balloon we cannot use the balloon dilatation there but we are talking about the condition where we can we can choose one of these so i'll take the condition of supraglottoplasty specifically any epiglottoplastic uh, surgeries so we have cold cut laser and coblation already so which instrument do you think is superior? Just have a look on this clips and decide by yourself. So here is one video 
where on the right side, this is a case of laryngomalacia and we are uh, doing the supraglottoplasty, aplasty specifically. On the right side, we are using CO2 laser uh, flexible fiber. And here you can see that after the CO2 laser, minimal charring has happened, but the time taken was pretty less. There is no blood drop. When uh, we use the wet cottonoid uh, cotton patty, you can see that there is hardly any charring left. So this is the result of the uh, CO2 laser on the right side in a case of aplasty. On the opposite side, we are using the cold cut instruments. Again, you observe and monitor the time taken for this procedure. See, there is no charring, of course, and there is hardly any bleeding after this uh, uh, operation. So this is the comparison between the laser and the cold cut. Which one is superior you can make out. Next we'll discuss about this coagulation. Here we did the aplasty again with the MLW1. Uh, so you can see I'll just run this uh, video parallelly here for the laser, cold cut and the coagulation all together. Here you can see there is no charring. Time taken for the surgery is almost the same. I'm sorry for this whiteout here. Then there is barely any bleeding. So no bleeding, time is the same, no charring. So almost all three techniques have given the uh, similar results according to uh, us. So to conclude this talk, I'll say yes, preparedness is important. We already discussed, be ready for the worst. Availability and affordability is the important factor, but most important is the surgeon's skill, which comes first, then the instruments, because ultimately, state-of-the-art medical technology skill needs a highly skilled pair of hands to use it. So I'll just conclude my talk here. Thanks a lot again to Raman Zan and Pralat sir for creating this excellent platform. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Deepa. I mean, you kind of uh, summed it all up for us, I think, but we need to uh, just have a few comments of this young lady uh, on lady's work from Sohit, from the panel. Sohit? I think uh, that was a, a great um, overview. Um, I think uh, uh, you showed us beautiful pictures about how uh, tools are just tools. And now we have a visualization of what we were saying since the morning. Um, was tools are just tools, it's eventually the skill of the surgeon. And I'm pretty sure those surgeries were being done by Dr. Raman, and that Absolutely. shows the skill of the surgeon. So, uh, beautiful work and uh, excellently done. Uh, just to reinforce that point between lasers and cold steel, uh, again, um, from an Indian perspective, cold steel might be a better way in the sense you'll reduce the cost to the patient uh, and uh, as we showed in our study eventually the outcomes remain similar whether using cold steel or whether using uh, laser uh, the only issue is the time uh, decreases when, when the child is suspended and spontaneously breathing when you're using the laser which of course is the reason why bleeding doesn't happen uh, I have had limited experience with the coagulation in the airway but uh, I think that's a that's a good tool to try um, balloons have been there for a while. Again, uh, the bottom line is you should know inside out about the tool you are, you are using. You should know the right settings you are, uh, of the tool you are using. You should know when to use that tool. So just because it's, uh, it's in vogue and it's in fashion, you don't want to use something which you're not trained into. Uh, get the proper training, learn everything about that tool, and then use it in the proper appropriate way. Uh, it's also important that you get the right anesthesia. I mean, the tubeless, I mean, the, the, the insufflation uh, through the mesopharynx. You have the entire larynx to yourself in these small children, and uh, that really helps. Uh, Kishore, any quick comments on Deepa's presentation? Were you there? He needs uh, to unmute yourself here. Yeah. Sorry. Kishore? Uh, congratulations on uh, your presentation. I had a small question to you. You know, in the first case, you know, with the road traffic accident, you showed that, uh, you know, the child has got two side stenosis and you incise the first one with uh, the cold steel instrument. Now, I think that is where uh, the advantage of the laser starts coming in. Do you think that uh, 
you know, the last, I mean, the, the post-stomp picture that you showed, there was an interretinoid band posteriorly placed. Now, do you think that, you know, when it was cut with a cold instrument and when it was balloon dilated, the, the, the tongue of these sort of, you know, granulations, which probably were remaining on either side, were actually squashed by the balloon. And then the squashed tongues posteriorly actually fused and formed the posterior band kind of a structure. Awesome. Uh, so that is where I think that is where I think the laser might be interesting tool, where you are actually incising it, and then you are vaporizing unilaterally or even bilaterally, because posteriorly, in fact, you know we have uh, the posterior glottic mucosa. I would imagine is intact. So that would mean that you know probably you know when the balloon uh, dilation was done at the first time. You know, it squashed the tongues on either side, which actually fused posteriorly. Because otherwise, how do you justify the development of a posterior glottic band between the two arytenoids? So I think the advantage of the laser to vaporize, not only to cut, but to vaporize it, so that, you know, the two areas are remaining away from each other. Because remember, the mucosa is a non-stick surface, is a non-stick area. So you can't imagine that, you know, the mucosa has stuck together to actually give rise to this posterior um, uh, fibrotic band. The only possibility is that there has to be some kind of granulation tissue after squashing after the balloon. And I think if you use the, the vocal fold retractor, you know, pretty sort of, you know, correctly, uh, you know, one can address using the laser all subglottic and upper tracheal lesions as well. So again, I mean, you know, it's, it's the way you use the tool, but finally, I think the whole objective should be that, yeah, fine, I mean, you know, I got a fantastic result, once I used my cold instruments, but I think post-operatively you did have the posterior glottic band of fibrous secretorial tissue. Now, what was the reason for that? Did, and of course, symptomatically, did the child have reduced arytenoid movements related to that? So, you know, all these things will start coming in. So to me, I think the laser uh, could have been an alternative, not only to cut, but even to vaporize. But oh, overall, I think it's fantastic results. I think the band was there already in the first slide itself. In addition to the addition between the cords, this band was already there. So this is halfway home, actually. This was during COVID times. So the child couldn't be brought back. Um, they couldn't travel. So we still have to attend to the child. But your comments are very well taken, Kishore. Uh, thank you. And um, uh, shall we move on to questions? Or somebody else wants to comment on the same case? Uh, yeah, Kishore. So, so one more, one more. One more, one more thing. One more thing, Deepa and, and Raman. Right? Always, I do for you know all these posterior glottic lesions, whether it is a band, whatever it is. I always tell the tell the patients to do uh, continuous blowing exercises. So you give them balloons and keep yes, on blowing. You did that. The point is, yeah. So you know the the idea being that you know you want the healing to happen in an abduction phase uh, to happen. Uh, so I think that is that is something that needs to be done. Absolutely. Any, uh, any comments? Yeah, Sachin? Yeah. Actually, uh, uh, very well presented. Uh, actually, this uh, was an incomplete web. Yeah. I, uh, I have classified glottic webs in complete and incomplete, and that has been published in American Journal. Uh, what precaution you have to take, as uh, Kishore has rightly pointed out, number one, preoperative video laryngoscopy is very important in cases of webs, whether the arytenoids are mobile. If there are mobile, just cutting it with scissors, laser, or poplet, whatever it is, would be enough. But when you are using laser or coblator, then you have to pass a neuropathy in the posterior glottis and then use laser or coblation and then cut the web. Otherwise, you are going to injure the virgin posterior glottic area. And that's what has happened. Maybe when you have used a coblator to cut over those uh, uh, little tags on the uh, vocal cord, maybe that thermal energy may have passed in the posterior glottis and that may have, and otherwise the balloon, and that have caused a posterior glottic web post operatively. So Certain I think that the web was there even before we used the yeah. coblator. That's so, what I was saying. So yeah. it's, yeah. Maybe, maybe yeah. So maybe. Uh, Parting in a uh, neuropathy yeah. or cutting the web may be an advantage to keep the posterior glottic intact. Yeah. 
otherwise a very good presentation yeah any other uh, comments uh, i would uh, uh, just uh, this completion part uh, what uh, yeah. sachin sir had said uh, that that is why the choice of the wand you select is very important if we use the evac or the prosize it is going to cause collateral damage because of the shape of the electrode the plasma formation is going to be 360 but when we use the micro laryngeal wand with a single electrode this is minimized for for sharp cutting we always use the micro laryngeal wand and for more debulking kind of surgeries or where we need a 360 plasma formation we tend to shift to the prosize side thank you so much i think we'll proceed and uh, answer some questions um do we uh, we have lot of uh, very uh, experienced people uh, shashi shashi there can somebody um, unmute shashi if he's around shashi is there okay rakesh shashi is there you will be okay shashi can you unmute yourself can you unmute yourself Okay, we'll go to Rakesh. We can always call Shashi back. Any comments, uh, Rakesh? You've got so much experience on today's proceedings. No, he's not there. Rakesh is not there. Um, is Thiru there? No, isn't there. Thiru. Okay. Then we have Doctor. Left after the talk was uh, Mary. He uh, was there. He's also not there. Mary is not there. Shashi is not there. Uh, Ajoy. Yeah, I think he's there. No, Ajoy, any no, comments? No, he's also not there, sir. Shan. No. Doctor Bilgi. No. Doctor Vidya Sagar is there. Doctor Vidya Sagar. Yeah, Vidya Sagar is there. Yeah. Vidya, can you unmute yourself? <laughs> Yeah. Hi sir. Yeah. Your comments. Very very nice lucid presentation from all the geniuses and fantastic. Any, any comments you yes. have on balloon? Yes sir. Because okay. yeah yeah yeah. I have comments on all of them. Yeah. I please. also feel like the same uh, uh, thing like uh, in the last one. I feel like the wand might have touched the posterior. No, I think, region that is what. No, no, sorry. I'm putting my case again. That band was there before the wand was used. Oh, okay. Okay. We'll just show you that film if you want. I'm, it's, it's no, no worries, sir. No worries. I think we have discussed it very nicely, so I yeah. think we could. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but the points are well taken. The points I mean, were very, very nicely yeah. taken, sir. Yeah. Very yeah. nicely taken, both for cold steel, laser, as well as the coblation. No, no. You it's can comment. Comment on all the talks, whatever questions, or you want to tell the audience because you are an yeah. experienced person yourself. Yeah. Th th thank you for the nice words, sir. But I I want to talk on behalf of all the ENT surgeons of India, where they may not have access to all these balloons or uh, other uh, expensive gadgets. Let's say a uh, 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 new ENT surgeon who has just gone in uh, for the practice has come across a subglottic stenosis. and he doesn't have access to the expensive merrell or acler and balloon will he be able to use a uh, foley's or can he use a uh, uh, cat lab uh, catheters or any balloon that he can get hold of or if so what is the precaution he needs to take and uh, uh, what is the, how he is going to gauge the pressure and the size to be used any comments would be appreciated Who wants to take that? There are a couple of things, uh, Vidya, which uh, uh, you can do. Number one is uh, uh, the the cardiac balloons are actually more expensive than the airway balloons. So uh, at least over here. So initially we were using uh, cardiac balloons over here, but they are actually way more expensive than the airway balloons. So uh, that's number one. Number two is you can use an endotracheal tube and essentially inflate the balloon of the endotracheal tube. You can connect it to a, ma a manometer uh, and actually gauge the cuff pressure um, and use it as a balloon dilatation device. Um, 
So I would recommend using an endotracheal balloon rather than a fully catheter for using the airway because that's something you are used to using. And of course, you always have the rigid dilators. You can order it from your pediatric uh, surgery colleagues. You all general surgeons have uh, booties uh, which you were, you were using for esophageal strictures. And you can definitely use it. Again, it's important to not use them multiple times because they produce shearing forces rather than the radial force which the balloon is made to produce. So it's the worst case scenario. You can use one of those to actually dilate your air. Dr. Arpit Sharma is here. Can somebody unmute? He's uh, another young airway surgeon from Bombay. Arpit, can you unmute yourself and uh, any comments? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Please. I, I am slightly bullish on coblation as vis a vis laser, and I've seen really good, excellent results with the coblation. If you, if you permit, I can show a quick video of three minutes showing a excellent healing with coblation. So what we have done is a grade three laryngeal subglottic stenosis. We have used coblation. The patient was scheduled for a, a, a PCTR, but since there was infection, as we normally do uh, see the airway because of infection, we postponed the surgery. And we thought of giving it a try with the coblation. If you permit, I can quickly show that video. Please, because I see it, I need to see it to believe it. Yes, sir. Uh, can I can I share my screen? Yeah, yeah, you can share the screen. Well, you want yeah. to, sh you know, run the video or uh, whatever, whatever application you are using, you share that application. You are opening with what application? Windows Media Player or QuickTime Player? Uh, uh, no, I will open my PowerPoint presentation. Okay, good. Yeah. So it is showing whiteboard. Should I uh, click? No, no, that? share PowerPoint presentation. No, no, you have to share, reshare. Reshare, new share, go to new share, share point by presentation. Uh, it is showing whiteboard, advanced. Con uh, Have you opened your PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, it is open. Uh, just a minute. Yeah, it's open. Yeah, you have to share that PowerPoint presentation, new share. Uh, when I'm uh, putting the share screen, it is showing basic advanced and files and a Dropbox. No, if you have shown your PowerPoint presentation, it will be seen there. In the back, it's open in the background. The PowerPoint is open in the background. So then you should be will see in one of the options. Go to new share or share. Share screen. Mm -hmm. share screen. Yeah, 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 just here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Arthur. Yeah, so it's a 13 year old boy who was referred to us from Endor. So uh, uh, as you can see, the patient had a history of a cerebral malaria. He was intubated, then extubated. Uh, over the period of time, he presented with distress. He was tracheostomized and with the tracheostomy, he was referred to us. So it was almost a grade four, but you will see a small pinpoint opening there down. But as you can see, it was quite a soft stenosis. Okay, so we did a we passed the endoscope through the tracheostomy to so see the condition of the airway, and on the tracheostoma there was quite a bit of an infection. So normally in presence of infection we avoid uh, any open surgeries. So we thought of like okay we'll schedule the surgery later, but in the meantime shall we try opening it with a coblator? So we started doing that, and it was just a kind of a see how it is going to open up or heal. So since it was a thin uh, soft stenosis. It started opening up quite well. And we were taking care not to kind of uh, touch the posterior tracheal wall and go anterior as much as possible. And I was I was being quite a bit tentative in this, whether it will open up or not. But whatever, I was like, there's no harm in trying this. Because we have seen like other places like granulation and healing well. So we thought we will try this. So as of now, the patient is having a tracheostomy. And uh, after this, we applied uh, steroid infiltration, topical uh, uh, steroid also. Infiltrated locally the steroid. And we did a balloon also in this case, uh, but that is kind of edited, I think. So this was the scopy after three weeks.
and you can still see the tracheostomy is still there so it kind of the uh, the results were really quite good for my believing so i thought okay, okay let's try again let's whatever these uh, small ridges are there if we can open that up further so it is uh, this is a third scopy after 3 weeks 3 more weeks so every time whenever we did the procedure we applied uh, uh, we infiltrated the steroids we applied topical steroid as well and as you can see there is no tracheostomy now so what happened in the middle when the patient went to indoor with the tracheostomy he accidentally deconverted himself and it started shrinking and patient was all right breathing from above so he's like i didn't bother to put it again so he came to us without any with a pin point opening so we didn't do anything much here we are sizing the airway by putting a rigid laring uh, bronchoscope and this was the final scopy after three more weeks so, so we did four scopies over the period of four months three to four months and this was the final picture there is no tracheostomy as of now and it has a uh, healed by secondary indentation the tracheostoma and uh, we did a uh, we did uh, we whenever we take the patient for a scopy we ask them to go a flight of stairs and we see if any there any kind of a uh, dyspnea is there while doing the flight of stairs here you can see it has mucosalized so well yeah yes yeah, sir that's it sir good thank you i mean i think uh, ultimately if you have given the per patient a performance status and is trickers me it out nothing like that so let's get uh, any comments anyone wants to make uh, whatever works is uh, wonderful i mean that's the best tool i guess uh, let, let's uh, can i add something yeah please okay uh, so great work arpit um, uh, i must say thank you uh, so when we started doing out uh, grade 3 and grade 4 stenosis we were very excited because you will get a few cases with yeah. grade 3 or grade 4 which are going to respond very well but over a long term uh, our study showed that grade 1 and grade 2 is the perfect stenosis for doing with percolation and you will get failures we learned to underdo rather than overdo like you went all around and at a part i could see a cartilage was exposed anteriorly this used to happen with me every time so that is just a beginner's step and it's good that you have insight you realize this and you had a fantastic result uh, you know it's very commendable uh, it's good to be uh, you know honest in uh, showing your work uh, that's very nice thank you so much uh, dr sonika is here she's raised a hand dr sonika you can uh, unmute yourself uh, if you're around dr sonika are you around okay any other comments uh, actually i want to just uh, have some comments on yeah. uh, in india if uh, i mean what to use and cost effective uh, treatment so as far as uh, the subprotic stenosis is concerned uh, the main issue is the history if the history of trauma is less than 3 months like what arpit showed then you can use bujis you can use uh, a uh, coblator you can use laser whatever you want to use the results would be equally good if you don't if, if if your trauma is only to the mucosa and not to the perichondrium don't go to the cartilage even trauma to the perichondrium is going to give inflammation granulations and restenosis so number one history is very important if it is within 3 months then yes you can use these instruments follow the patients number two if you want to use balloons in india they are available from mumbai they are quite cost effective around 14 to 15000 from meril so i think uh, those can be uh, kept in your operation theater usually we do balloon dilatation or maybe dilatation uh, in a sequential manner maybe two or three times as the wound heals what we do we ask the patient to buy a balloon from for himself every time patient it requires patient can get the same balloon and you can reuse the same balloon 
up to four to five, six times uh, for that patient, which would be sufficient for that. So I think that can be used uh, and make it more cost effective uh, like that. So I think uh, this would be uh, answer some questions. Thank you, Dr. Sachin. I think uh, Dr. Kishore wanted to say something. Kishore, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I just I just, I just wanted to ask uh, Arpit, Arpit, fantastic results, thank you. You know, one of the things which I noticed in the video is that this is a grade three severe subglottic or rather, you know, stenosis, but with a shorter craniocaudal distance. Yeah. Yeah? So, you know, unless, you know, uh, it is, this is less than 10 millimeters. Now, once the child or this child of 13 years of age has born, got decannulated, this craniocaudal distance with those additional bands coming up, do you agree that this craniocaudal distance has become larger and longer? Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the mucosal damage, you know, is there. We were lucky that the child was, was decannulated, so that's really nice. But I think, again, let's start comparing a 13-year-old kid whose trachea is almost like an adult trachea vis-a-vis a child who is less than two, you know, where these two situations are totally different. So again, for younger colleagues, you know, who are online with us, you know, let's get, get this thing very clear that be careful. Uh, these two subsets of patients is totally different. Remember to use these uh, sort of, you know, devices prudently with caution, et cetera, et cetera. And just one last point to what Vidya Sagar said, what are the various devices that can be used by a novice ENT surgeon? Vidya Sagar, these kind of surgeries are not for novice surgeons. We must be able to sort of, you know, send this message to as many colleagues as possible that please remember that yes, to get away from a smaller sort of, you know, in an emergency is good enough. Child is born with a bilateral coronal membranous atresia. You're trying to sort of perforate that Fair enough. There is a very thin uh, uh, diaphragmatic uh, sort of, you know, stenosis. Fair enough. But, you know, if you're looking at, you know, to do a definitive treatment, be careful. Lots of devices are there in the market. Lots of things like from bougies to whatever you want to, they are there in the market. But again, this is a dedicated work. Your first shot either helps the child or the child will remain handicapped for a significant period of time. So you must remember that you, you, you have the responsibility for this particular family and this particular patient. Thank uh, you. Thank, thank you, Krishna. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So uh, I really want to just show the healing that was happening with the cobulator vis-a-vis -vis laser. I feel right. it's too superior maybe because of the less heat generated. Sure, and sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. And with the steroid infiltration, maybe that has also worked. And the kind of uh, mucosa we are seeing after three weeks, every every three weeks, because showing a good mucosalization with good blood supply, which was not showing though that much of a fibrosis. I totally okay. agree. In a younger people, it is going to be much more difficult. And we did with a kind of a tentatively only key that if it is not working, we will go for an open surgery. Yeah. Sure. Obviously, treatment has to be customized for each patient. Deepak, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I'll echo what Kishore said. Uh, it's very important. It's not something you should just go and do. Um, what Deepa said earlier, being prepared is very important. It's not something someone should just go in and say, okay, let me try this. You should go in prepared to have a full set of whatever is needed. Um, your template is a good one for other centers if they want to get started, or there might be other centers who are doing it. It's good to send that out that you should be doing it properly, not something you should be doing it. Comment on Arpit's video. Um, if it is a soft stenosis, I don't know if I would, would use any other tool than just balloon dilate because that would by itself would have opened up everything, caused less trauma. And then on top of it, when you use the steroid, probably would be enough if it is a soft stenosis. If it is a firm, well-developed stenosis, then yes, any of these tools, coblation will be a good one to use it in those situations. Uh, but if it is a soft one, just balloon would be sufficient. Thank you. Alok, you wanted to say something? Well, I sort of quite agree with the comment you made about uh, about individualizing treatment, but sometimes that can be taken as carte blanche to do anything and everything. And you have to be 
careful with that one. So I mean, it's fairly clearly set out as to when to do open and when to do endoscopic, and there are gray areas, and of course, gray areas uh, need experience to, uh, to to sort out. And I generally agree with the thought that uh, these are surgeries which should be referred to specialized uh, uh, so, centers, except in the emergency situation uh, that uh, comes through. So, uh, I mean, obviously, every patient that we have seen here has been well uh, managed, and obviously, everyone out here is doing exceptionally good work and we've seen examples of it but all i wanted to say was that uh, that uh, there are protocols on how to treat these patients and uh, just saying that everything should be individually uh, can be individually managed and sometimes oversimplify things right. Right. so thank you very much and i think uh, any last minute comments yeah actually there is one question okay about me yeah yeah go ahead and uh, I would like to just tell uh, some precautions we take. Uh, pneumothorax is a known uh, maybe limitation of a rigid buji or rigid dilatation that is a buji because the buji passes down into the lower trachea and maybe it can injure some bronchioles. That's why balloon has got in, uh, advantage over buji is it acts locally. If uh, anesthetist would tell on table there is a ventilation problem and there is a reduced air entry so what you can do is ask the uh, a chest x-ray in the operation theater and again do the further things as the pulmonologist suggest but there can be a delayed pneumothorax and that's what i want to stress on ot finished patient goes into the ward and maybe four hours after the surgery he can develop a pneumothorax so what we have started doing is have a chest x-ray done of each and every patient in the recovery or when he reaches the ward. So I think this delayed pneumothorax has to be kept in mind uh, and before you discharge the patient, have a chest x-ray done within 6 to 12 hours and then only discharge the patient in the evening. So thank you. Uh, any more comments? Last minute. Can I make a just quick comment on what Sachin said? That's absolutely correct. Now I think one of the things which is really important if you're doing a rigid bujinage is to measure Sachin the exact distance between the uh, let's say you know you have whatever laryngoscope you're using. So I think the length of your bougie and whether it is going to cause any kind of airway trauma is very very critical. Not only that, so you know, there are ways of sort of you know knowing what is the length that you don't want to go beyond to avoid a lower tracheal or a carinal or bronchial sort of you know trauma. So, any kind of airway tear is found out even before. The second thing is, I think, endoscopic uh, uh, confirmation that you know we do not have we have not left the uh, the, uh, the the OR uh, without sort of you know confirming that there is no airway tear and possibly these late uh, sort of, you know, uh, pneumothoraces are basically related to these very, very tiny looking uh, sort of, you know, airway tears. Patient goes to the operating, uh, patient goes outside the operating rooms on a closed glottis, he's coughing. So he's creating an increased positive pressure subglottic tracheally. And this is what actually goes into the pneumothoraces. So basically the objective, the point I'm trying to make is that do not leave without confirming that there is no airway tear distally is very, very critical. And there are ways and means in which we can avoid a problem with the bujinage. So there are advantages of bujinage. There are advantages of the balloons. I think the indications and how to use it are the two critical points which are really, really important. Right. So thank you very much. Any more uh, last minute comments? Yes, sir. Sir, can I have 60 seconds to... Uh, okay, quickly. Video, sir? Pardon? Uh, to replay that video, sir. Oh my God. Okay. Okay. She wants to prove a point. Uh, no, yeah. I just want to, uh, you know, understand uh, basically what Kishosa said. Okay, he, this image is the, the first video and this one is the post-op one. So here, this band which we dealt with uh, with scissor, and, uh, we can make out this this posterior thin line. Is already there. 
Yeah. This this is already there, which is still remain. We did not do anything. So if you are using the laser, you want me to cut that part as well, or just leave it like that? No, no, totally. Deepa, I understood understood the situation completely. Agreed with you, hundred percent. Yes. Okay, sir. So we we did not do anything there, and yeah, absolutely. We, uh, totally. This was not the trauma with the coblation also. Yeah, yeah, got it. I was not the surgeon. Raman sir performed the procedure. No, 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 no. That's okay. That's okay. It's we have to have a nice. No, I know. If I do something, definitely there will be disaster with this fancy tool. No, 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 no. You don't. I think. I think you did. I think you did a good job, Deepa. I think you know you made your point very well. The point very well taken and appreciated. Yeah. Thank you. Thank. So all the um, experts, uh, the panelists, the speakers. I, I think it was for me. I think it was a wonderful learning experience. And uh, if we can get this kind of message across that these instruments can be dangerous, please choose the right instrument. Keep in mind your skill. Keep in mind your support services. That is also important. You have to have good support services after whatever you do. Uh, so choose the right uh, um, instrument and use it for the right patient. So thank you very much. Thank you, Prahlad. Without you, we wouldn't, it wouldn't have been possible to continue this series. And the next one episode we are getting that is, is of interest to a large number of ENT surgeons out there in the periphery. It's going to be foreign bodies, aerodigestive tract foreign bodies. And our panel is always invited. It's a lifelong invitation for you. Please be there. Guide our younger surgeons. We'll be very grateful to you like you've done today. Thank you so much. We'll call thank, you, it. thank you very much. I, I, I thank all the panelists and the speakers for the wonderful contribution. Thank you again. And the audience also. Yes, yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you.